afternoon and welcome to the incredibly dramatic skies on our live sunset safari over the last few hours we've been watching a bank of clouds roll in and now we're watching as it slowly scuds completely past us my name is Jamie and this afternoon I have them back on the vehicle once again having got back yesterday from his leave actually two days ago now I think it's two days ago now and we are coming to you live from Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserves in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. Now not only are we live but we're also interactive which means send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through on questions at wildearth.tv. Before we launch into our plans for the afternoon just have a look at this incredibly oh, dramatic skies that we have right now. I'm saying ooh, because all of a sudden it's raining on us. <laughs> but basically what we'd be doing is we actually thought we were gonna end up postponing the start of the sunset safari. As the storm came in, the wind was howling, it was all dramatic, and now it's all gone to the Kruger National Park, which isn't such a bad thing. That's actually a wonderful thing, because that side of Kruger really does need the rain. It would have been very nice if it had arrived with us as well. But it got to the point where it really looked like it was going to miss us. So much so that we actually haven't put our rain covers on our car. But so far this is just two big drops, drops of rain and that's pretty much it. I don't think it's actually going to properly rain upon us. I don't think so anyway. That question remains to be seen. And that's one of the big reasons why I haven't gone racing off to the eastern side of Juma, which is where the lions are with their kill. It's because I wanted to get an idea of which way the wind was blowing, quite literally, to determine whether or not we were going to have to make a very hurried escape. Those of you who've been watching over the last few days know that a hurried escape from that particular spot is not really all that possible. And at one point, it honestly looked so ominous, I thought the heavens were going to open and bring down a deluge of rain. It is deluging over there. Which is great for us because it means that we can go ahead with our sunset safari. We're not really geared to cope with torrential downpours, but it is disappointing in that it means we don't get any more rainfall in this particular spot just yet. And I think it's probably safe enough for us to start heading towards those lines. But in the meantime, Mr. Hendry, of course, is back from leave. And the strange weather has brought out his strange antics and he seems to be up a tree again. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to this section of your sunset safari. The sun will not be setting in the direction that I am standing. I have been framed here looking out east by Jean Dre who is on camera with us today. He thinks that the uh, grey background to my grey personality would fit rather nicely. We were rather hoping the sun might come out and light me beautifully so that my inescapably poor looks might be improved by the natural lighting. Anyway, as Jamie has shown you, we have had some very dramatic skies today, and Jandre is showing you more of those now. now. We're as live as Jamie is, so please do talk to us. My name is James, and you can talk to me, of course, during the next three hours, provided the deluge does not hit us as we drive around. We will then head for home if it does. But you can talk to me, hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv, and we can answer any questions that you might have or address any comments that you might like to make about what we're doing, where we are in the world, or any of the animals that we are hopefully going to see. Our plan this afternoon, if I don't injure myself horribly coming down from this tree, is to head towards the cubs of Karula, the young prince and princess, Shongile the female, Hosanna the male. It was very difficult for me to say those two names, but I've done it anyway because I'm brave of spirit. And um, we're going to go towards where they were eating little scrub hair this morning that we think the little male, Hosanna, managed to kill, which was very clever of him, of course. Jamie, I think, is heading towards the lions. And all of that is going to take place, of course, in the event that the weather does not close in on us too much. There are many sticks sticking up my shorts right now. It's deeply uncomfortable, but I shall keep talking uh, without breaking stride. And I shall walk gently down this tree as if it is a flight of steps. There you are, Andre. Not bad for an old man, is it? Bravo. Thank you so much. 
I think that's all I have to tell you, everybody. So now we can get on with the business end of our, our little game drive. Kirsty gives you three out of ten for the performance. Kirsty gets me three out of ten for the performance. That's because Kirsten is inescapably not nice to me, of course, you see. She's very harsh, very harsh woman indeed. And that's because she's a redhead and therefore has no soul. Okay. On we go. This... This tree is the gym. It's not only a very good uh, perching spot, that is where uh, we do our bush gym sometimes. But really kind of odd, odd clouds for this time of the year. We really thought it was going to rain, but it didn't. There were a few spits and spots while I was standing on the tree there, waiting for Jamie to do her introduction and view of the beautiful clouds. And I'm sure you'll have that more than just the twice that you've had it today already because it is so very special to see a sky like this, especially in the middle of July. Well, no, we're not actually in the middle of the July anymore, are we, Jean-André? No, indeed, we are on the beginning of August. Women's Month. I don't know if that's a worldwide thing. I think it's just in South Africa. Oh, and I must just say... Um, Yesterday, I forgot this completely, but yesterday was World Rangers Day, and we're often confused, I think, uh, you know, Jamie and Brent and I, for rangers. We aren't rangers, really. Uh, we've all done some kind of ranging work, but we're guides, and rangers are the guys, the selfless people that spend their days out in the wild protecting these wilderness areas. And especially at this time of our history when elephants and rhino especially are under siege, it's those selfless people who do what they do for very little money, monetary reward in the Kruger, um, into Mozambique, into Zimbabwe and all the other great wilderness areas of Africa. It's those people uh, for whom the day was yesterday and it's in their honour. And I'm sorry that I forgot about it yesterday, but I'd just like to give a shout out to all of the rangers around the world, especially the African ones who are protecting our last rhino and elephants. And all the other species, of course. There is a brief uh, or sort of subtle smell of petrichor in the air. Uh, and petrichor, for those of you who don't know, is <laughs> a delightful smell of rain, the first rains, and it comes, as far as I can tell from the various articles you've all very kindly sent me on it, is from some sort of um, oils that are released into the air. Uh, some, some say it's fungal spores, but I think it is probably the oils that are released out of the soil, sort of, um, what do they call them? Jean-Dre, essential oils uh, that are released from the soil by the moisture. And it's that that we smell, that delightful smell of petrichor when you have the first rains on the soil. But I don't think it's going to rain too much more than it has already. You can see off the... You know, I think it's just a very strange sort of storm that gathered above us and then moved off. And lots of you are saying you hope for rain. Well, we'd like to have some rain too. I don't think it's going to happen, but maybe that cloud will turn around and come back and dump on us. We've had 20 mils already, which in July... You know, I know, I'm sure everybody said it's really unusual that we should have rain in July. Um, and it's... that's interesting. I didn't know the lions were in that direction. I think Jamie was avoiding... I think Jamie was avoiding the weather. Oh no, madam, I couldn't possibly. Oh no. No, I couldn't. I couldn't. No, no. No, no, really. No, really, I couldn't. As you were. Yes. Okay, are you going to go Chola Pan Road or...? I'm going to go Chola Pan and then... Perfect. I'll go all the way down. Okay. Bye, Viam. Um, just about every year since I've been working in this area, there's been one strange rainstorm in the winter time. So yes, while it is unseasonable, it's not that unusual. But the weather 
Somebody said to me as I was on as I was on leave, they said, you know, every single winter is the coldest winter on living record, and every single summer is the hottest summer on living record. It's like every male lion you see for the first time is the biggest male lion you've ever seen. Um, so, yeah, I, I tend to. I, I tend to, these days, try and kind of lessen my adjectives on the weather, but it, it is difficult. Let's head across to Jamie, find out where she's going. Well, I've told you where she's going, so she can tell you again, and we'll head to the south. And there's nothing like a little bit of repetition to set the tone for this afternoon. I'm going to go towards those lines. Unfortunately, James and myself have been doing some lurking close to camp, just in case the storm changes direction. It doesn't look like it's going to. It looks as though we're quite okay. And so James and myself shall split at the start of this road. I shall go off to the left. James shall go straight. And thus we shall divide our time more efficiently in terms of looking for wonderful things to show you. Why is he hooting at me? Is he hooting to say goodbye? <laughs> Bye! <laughs> I didn't even know these cars could hoot. How do you make them hoot? How do you do that? Uh, is this one broken? That's so disappointing. <laughs> I know that... I can't remember which vehicle I was on. It was Jigger. I know that Jigger will definitely sound the alarm if you press the wrong immobilizer button. I know because I did that during my interview drive when I was parked for the very first viewing of the six cubs last year. I know that Jigger can certainly make plenty of sound when she wants to. You can imagine the sinking feeling that befell me as that moment occurred. It was utterly traumatizing for myself. Not so much for the lions didn't even lift their heads, but at the time it felt like the worst faux pas I could possibly have made. Obviously the very kind bosses decided to overlook such a transgression, very fortunately for me. I'm so disappointed I couldn't hoot back in response, but anyway, we shall continue on. James is absolutely right. There is a truly beautiful smell in the air at the moment. And a very warm welcome on our way to look at some tawny lions. Amy, you wanted to know about white lions and whether or not they could survive in the wild. Amy, they do survive in the wild. There's a population in the Timbavati that the white lion gene is quite powerful. Recently, very recently, that genetic, because it is of course a recessive gene, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment, but very recently that gene somehow hopped around over the entire half of Kruger and into a place called Singita, or the Singita Concession near Labombo, the Labombo Mountains. And there, all of a sudden, two little white lion cubs were born. So essentially, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the white lion's genetics, it is a recessive gene. And therefore, o white lion offspring can only be born to two parents that carry that gene. And even then, it's only about a 25% uh, chance that the offspring will be born white. Unless you've got two white lion parents. Now, that being said, White lions have less of a chance of surviving than the normal tawny colored lions. That's because A, their skin is more sensitive to the sun as, as well as their eyes. And B, as you can imagine, it um, messes with their coloring ever so slightly because the one color that really truly stands out in the African bush felt is white. A flash of white stands out so clearly. So they don't survive as their, their survival rates are a little bit lower. But because a lion is a social cat, I think, it slightly skews it in favor if it had been a oh look Viam, there's a giraffe staring down upon us <laughs> very dark colored sorry Amy we'll go back to our white lion discussion in a moment but for now we have a giraffe with an ox picker or two or three on on its back giraffe have been incredibly scarce over the last few drives I don't know why that has been this one is such a rich, dark colour. A mature bull in his prime. Hello, mister. Where have all of our giraffe been hiding? Really nice to see one, actually. Although this one seems to be very much intently on the move. 
I know that it's a bull, first of all, by just his size. He is much, much larger than the females. And then that dark color, even the old females that have the genetic predisposition to being slightly darker in color, even they never reach quite that sort of tonal, almost black color. Hey, boy. They walk deceptively quickly. Looks like they're just strolling, but of course when your legs are two meters long, a lot more ground is covered. We'll try and keep up with him for a little bit, just because it has been a while since we've seen Giraffe, but I think as soon as we reposition, he does seem to be very much on the move. But we'll try and stick with him. I know at least one of our viewers, Tiffany, absolutely loves giraffe. They're her favorites to see. I hope she's watching this afternoon. But recently we've been asked by a lot of viewers where our giraffe are hiding. Looks like there was rain here. Interesting. Just some puddles in the road. This is just moving through the sea lines, perhaps. Still, every now and again, we're getting drops of rain. Hello, boy. Can we come say hello? Isn't he, though? Don is absolutely right. He is absolutely gorgeous. Oh. He was having a scratch. And when you don't have hands, and you certainly can't get your feet up to where the ticks sit, then scratching on the nearest vegetation is your next best choice. And of course those sensitive areas are the ones that attract the ticks. So he is reversing <laughs> back onto a tree. And are we going to go forward again? Yep, we're going forward again. Get in under those legs. <laughs> Often you come upon trees that have a fallen victim to such methods. Oh, we're going backwards again. Of um, helping with an itch. Elephants and giraffe both do it. And you'll sometimes find that they are slightly the worse for wear, for the wear after a and an assault of this nature. There we go. Not the gentlest of method. Oh, we're going forward again. Oh, it must be really itchy. <laughs> Back again. So not the gentlest of methods. At least he's picked a bush willow and not something with thorns. Not that he would have. Something's attracted his attention. What have you seen? Ah, are we going back again? No. Done. The itch has been dealt with. And those pesky ticks, I think if we found we went and examined that tree a little bit more closely, we'd probably find one or two straggling ticks waving their legs in the air. Oh wow! Fish eagle's calling as well. To where it is sounded very close to us. And our giraffe gentleman, absolutely right. He is quite gorgeous. A really deep, rich colour. There's his ox picker friends. Now that they, he's finished his scratching, they can come and give him a hand with picking up the remainder of the ticks. And he is munching away on a buffalo thorn. In the top of his ossicones. The older a giraffe gets, the more prominent those bones become around his skull. So if you look really closely, you'll see the two protruding behind the horns. There we go. Thank you, Biam. See those little sort of outgrowths underneath what we, well, I'm terming colloquially the horns. They're not horns, they're ossicones. Oh, so many ox pickers on one's head. Just gets a bit much, even for this giraffe. <laughs> you can see the irritation in him.
and welcome back to Dispatch Griffin. It's lovely to have you on board once again. Dispatch, I believe, is one of our newest addicts. And Dispatch actually, strangely enough, predicted the lion hunt, kind of accidentally, having told us that our quiet morning was the calm before the storm, which proved to be 100% correct. And Dispatch wants to know if all of the giraffes of Africa are so docile, or if it's just because, like our elephants, these giraffes have become accustomed to our presence. A little bit of both. Uh, giraffe tend to be one of the easier animals to habituate. Oh, that's so delicious. Giving us a lovely view of his tongue. Hello, beautiful. Um, so it is a combination. Yes, this giraffe, like all of the animals of the Sabi sand, just not, not just the elephants, but the antelope, the zebra, the buffalo, they've all become accustomed and from the moment of their birth probably have had vehicles driving around them. That's one of the big reasons. But giraffe do habituate easily. They're one of the animals that can actually become incredibly habituated to the point that you might even see some movies or videos of giraffes sticking their heads through car windows, into um, lodges, especially in areas where they have been, whether correctly or not, usually incorrectly, fed in some way. They can actually be surprisingly dangerous. I've seen an incredible video as our giraffe moves off. I've seen an incredible video of a giraffe chasing a field guide with a vehicle full of tourists. Now that must be the most bizarre experience. Imagine you're having to pick up the radio and saying, I'm, I'm being attacked by a giraffe and I don't quite know how to handle it. Because what do you do? Do you, do you try and chase it away? Um, they've got a serious kick. I've seen a few smashed windscreens as a result of a giraffe or people getting a little bit too what's the word, blasé, around giraffe and getting too close. And the giraffe turned around and went, well, actually, I'm close to a ton in weight and I've got two meter long legs that are incredibly powerful. And gave very clear demonstrations of that. I'm going to try reposition one more time. The light's very difficult. And he's playing, now he's playing hard to get, but we'll try one more time. Just so that we can answer Jesse's question. Oh, he is very tricky. We'll just get the top of his head sticking out there. Jesse, giraffe don't have a set breeding time. So they will breed throughout the year. They don't have a rut like the impala or the wildebeest or even the warthogs do. They breed throughout the year. You'll find that there is a spike in births around the summer months, which makes sense because it's the rainy season, so therefore there's the most food available for the mothers and the babies. But generally what will happen is these bulls will wander around if they happen to find a female in estrus, and it's something that we've seen before on these live safaris, they will court her for many, many days, often two weeks. And she, they sort of try very hard to convince her to mate with them, and most of the time she rejects them. And she does that for a very good reason, because she's waiting. It's instinct, and it allows her to wait for the best possible male to pass on his genetics. Now, this gentleman would be a truly good match, or suitor, or any female giraffe. He's big, he's in prime condition. A deep rich color is indicative of plenty of testosterone. So he is a male in his prime. And it's only when two males come together over a female in estrus that they will actually properly collide. And a serious giraffe fight is very, very rare to witness. But it is, you often see them sparring with each other, learning their strength, gauging their strength. But a true fight where they really seriously go for each other is quite incredible. They w and they can occasionally result in the death of one of the contestants. I recently read, this is to take things down a slightly more depressing route, but it's something that I read that I found really, truly fascinating. I recently read a story that was seen by one of the guests in the Kruger National Park where a giraffe fight occurred and the loser was knocked to the floor and obviously had a broken leg or something had broken because it couldn't get up and it couldn't get up. Maybe a broken pelvis because they do slip quite easily on the tarred road. In an aeroplane somewhere making a lot of noise. I don't know where it is. Oh, it's going into land. There we go. Well done, VM. <laughs> Not something we often see at this time of day. Anyway, this poor giraffe couldn't get up again and the guest reported that this giraffe actually ended up ended up committing suicide 
Now, whether or not that's true or not, uh, it's a difficult one to, to gauge. But I have heard stories of animals doing that, particularly when they're grievously injured or they're unhappy about something. Which is quite a scary thought, and it just goes, gives us a little bit more insight into animals' state of mind. Our giraffe is playing really hard to get now, to go on to more happier things. He is well and intact and fully healthy, and I think we'll probably move on for now before the other vehicles start heading out so that we can go and book our place at the Lions. I'm very much excited about seeing those little cubs one more time. I'm really hoping we're going to get to the stage where the youngest set will be old enough to come out and about and we'll get to see all eight little Nkahumas. And then there's also one part of me that really wants to go and check up and see that little cub again for myself. I only noticed it at the end of the sunrise safari two days ago, but one of the Nkahuma cubs has a limp and I just want to go and see if I can work out exactly what's happened to it. Thank you mister. He has all but disappeared into the darkness of the trees. The sun feels like it's about to come out. It's turned into a really lovely still afternoon after all of the dramatic wind that was blowing earlier. as we did that the sun came out. Bizarre. I wonder where that cold front came from. The clouds that came in from the south have basically passed. They're blowing away now with a short sharp, what must have been a short sharp cloud burst. And there's nothing following them. It's just blue skies. I was about to say July is a very strange month in terms of transitional weather. But it's not July anymore, is it? It's August as of today. August, I guess, is a strange transitional month. And perhaps we shall encounter some elephants on our way towards the lions. Speaking of the rain and the fact that in a way it has almost been unexpected, it's been very nice to have as much rain as we've had in the winter months, Aaron would like to know if there's any animals that we're going to see more of if we do get good rains this year. And the answer is not really. Funnily enough, in terms of for us, not that we obviously we want what's best for the environment, not for us as, in terms of game viewing. For us, the drought actually provides the best possible game viewing that we could see because the animals are forced into smaller areas, into more concentrated areas around water holes. And Aaron, you might have noticed that most, a lot of our general game dispersed as soon as we had that little bit of rain. And that's what happens in summer. It gets harder. First of all, it's really hard to see things. And second of all, the animals are more, as I said, they're more widely dispersed. They're not concentrated around water holes. I can't think of a species that we would see more of. We might maybe see bigger herds of buffalo coming through, although they've been forced into this area anyway because of the lack of water in the Kruger National Park. I can't think of a species we'll see more of. We'll see lots and lots of little impala and baby wildebeest. That's always the, but we're going to see that anyway, regardless of what happens with the rainfall. The question is whether or not they will survive in future. We will probably see more hippopotamus. They might move in from areas where they've been a bit more concentrated if the dams start to fill up. But that is probably it. I can't think of anything else. And bird life might be quite spectacular. I found that the bird life was quite subdued this year, thanks to in the middle of summer, thanks to the lack of rainfalls. We've got the kudu, um, the kudu, the cuckoos coming in and the various migratory species and they came in for a couple of weeks and then they kind of dispersed off towards the reserves closer to the mountains that had more rain. 
And we might see more bird species. We will definitely, the one thing we will see, Aaron, I'm thinking mammal species, but one thing we will see is lots and lots of insects. This year's insect explosion was very much reduced. But in summer, when the, when the rains come properly, dung beetles flying everywhere, black eyes for the person holding the spotlight or for the cameraman sitting behind the presenter light that attracts all the bugs, we'll have so many awesome insects to look forward to. And that's when bushwalk really comes into its own because you really do have this opportunity to observe things up close and personally and become acquainted with all of the creepy crawlies or the hohos as we call them in colloquial South African. There will be an insect explosion, that is one thing I will tell you, and probably more reptiles as well. Because we felt, I felt very much as though we were lacking in chameleons during the summer months this year. But then it was also my first summer spent in the northern Sabi sands, so I don't know what's normal for this area. Oh, hello little boy. Spotted the Anyala on the left. There was a little gentleman waiting to cross the road. Look at you, with your silly little horns. Not so silly little horns, actually. Hello, boy. He hasn't even got his adult colouring yet. And there's another little one, off to his right. Also a male. Look closely. You'll see the horns starting to poke through at the top of the head there. I always wonder if that's really itchy for them. Like getting teeth, but different. in fact, it's probably itchy sore, like toddlers experiencing teething. There are two little boys, actually. Anyala, like the giraffe, don't have a set breeding time. Although, one, look at the, all the stripes on the one on the right. But they don't have a set breeding season, they'll breed at any time of the year. And shame, I called this little one's horns a bit pathetic. But actually, those daggers are what, when they become the most dangerous. We were speaking to Mike, who lives next door to us, and those of you who were watching will remember that the, we found a dead, or there was a dead male in Yala that had been completely eaten by vultures, hadn't been eaten by a leopard or a lion or hyenas, and that, had, we found out, had been died in a fight with another Nyala next to Mike's house and he'd gone and dragged it to that area away from his fence line and he said that the male Nyala was a full gro it was a full grown male Nyala he said it was killed by because he was watching a young male that was a little bit older than the one that we just saw but you know when they start to grow their horns are like little daggers they're about that long and they're really really sharp and pointed and apparently this little Nyala got cornered and turned around and pierced the lung of the older Nyala not to be trifled with, a couple of deaths, human deaths related to Nyala and Bushbuck living in people's gardens. But they still should be treated with utmost respect. Ah, I hear that James has been driving through some dense vegetation. Let us go find out what he was up to and what he has to show you. Hello everybody. We've come to Karula sighting here. That seems to be her. I've got to tell you, I think there's something a bit odd about this. The coat looks much too yellow. But while I try and assess what's going on there, just up on the bank here, jean has managed to spot both cubs. They're up top there. We might try and reposition around there. I'm just going to have a look, see if this is... Madame Karula. It just looked a little odd, but maybe she's just had a bath. She's just been to the salon. And I can't really see her face, or her spot patterns, or her wow. But I can't actually see much at all. All right, so for those of you who weren't with us this morning, Herbert tracked. Uh, the leopards in here um, and then we came in and we managed to see the little cub Hosanna and he had killed a scrub hare and possibly his first kill on his own and we've come back in here now to see them at the original kill that Herbert found 
Now, that's not Karula. I think that's a male. I think this is a young male. It's definitely not her. So what's going on? The two cubs are up there. I wonder if it's not Tingana. I'm just trying to see the spot pattern. He's one, two, three, four, one, two, he's four, four. Tingana's four, four, is he? Tingana is, or oh, five, five. I can't see exactly. Mvula is four, three. I don't think that's Mvula. I just, I can't get, I can't see him properly through the bushes there. Crystal H, you say this is Tingana. Brilliant stuff. And there he is moving it. So, this is tremendously exciting. We've got possibly the, most likely the father of the two cubs. The two cubs are up there on the bank. Have you got Karula there? And then we've got Karula behind. This is fantastic stuff. We've got Karula behind the tree with the two cubs there. There she, I can see her moving and I can hear Tingana growling at her. Yes, I can see now. Now she's laying down. Two cubs up there. Now this is not uncommon, of course. Big male leopards will steal their kills from the females. What we're going to do is go around the side, the other side there, Genre, I think we might get a better view from there and we'll certainly get a view of the others. Isn't this exciting? This is just fantastic. A sort of a family meal. Obviously Dad was late home from work so he's eating on his own there. Jandro's actually got a much better view than the one I've got. This is fantastic stuff. I'm just going to quickly call it in and then we'll move. Yeah, F, I relocated here off Ledwood Road. Um, now four animals on site. Tingana is here as well. But we've got maybe one out of five visual. Okay, let's move. And if we can't see anything, then we'll come back here. Now, the reason I'm speaking slightly more soporifically, uh, Brent just said that Karula was a little uneasy this morning and gave him a bit of a growl. He wasn't sure if he thought it was most likely that the leopardess was growling at her cubs rather than Brent. But we moved, we were easing very gently in here. Jean, don't, just make sure I don't tip you into the drainage there, if you don't mind. You know, I'm obviously mostly concerned about the vehicle. Um, It's amazing. Yeah, you know, it's not going to be easy to do this. Um, Deborah Armchair Traveller, while we turn around, you say the last time you saw Tingani he was very thin and you wonder if he stole this kill. I think it's almost certain that he stole this kill. She wouldn't approach a kill with her cubs that he had made. Well, it's I say that, it's unlikely. It's certainly not impossible, but it's unlikely. Uh, but he, of course, being a big male, this is his territory, and he's, le male leopards are good scavengers, um, he may well try and scavenge from her, and I suspect that's what's happened. You're right there, Jean-André. He says all good, quite quietly, that's good. Right. <laughs> Of course, every tree that could possibly in the way is in the way. And we don't want to end up in this drainage line, for it is not shallow. Indeed, it is very deep. And Wendy, in her deeply aged state, is unlikely to get out. There's a lovely view of him. Say when, uh, Jandri. Good view of him now, everybody. Hmm. 
Mm. Cat and Tampa, you say much family going on with all the leopards at the moment. Yes, there is quite a sort of family thing going on, isn't there? It's just he's just growling. So we've got lions with the males and the females and the cubs. Leopards the same. This is just fantastic. Okay, let's move around. Wow, I didn't expect that. <laughs> now, Jandri, please watch out on the left-hand side. Well, this might not decapitate you. It will certainly do some serious damage. All right. Right, we're going to try and, I was going to say ease, but it's difficult to ease in bush like this. We'll go around the side there. And while we, while we do that, I think let's go back to Jamie, find out what's going on with those lions. And I'll try and get into a position in slightly more quiet position. Oh, how exciting is that? Four different leopards in one place. Amazing. Well, we have arrived at the buffalo kill, and it's incredible. There's no lions here, by the way. They are completely gone, and the carcass is totally picked clean. Just some bits of skin, and a little bit, and the head left. And it's quite, I just think to Viam, it's actually quite a profound experience watching something like this, because two days ago, this buffalo was alive and well and sprinting towards the car, and so much has changed, and it's provided food for... How many lions is that? There were at least six, no, there were five cubs here, plus the five lionesses, that's ten, plus the two males, that's twelve lions. And the twelve lions have finished off this carcass incredibly quickly, and it looks like they've all since left the area. There's nobody here except one lonely vulture sitting on the top of that dead tree. And just like that, the circle of life is pretty much complete. And then after that, it's down to the worms, the horn moth larvae that will start to settle in, and the various bacteria. And we've seen, we've closely examined lots of different types of bones and skulls and horns. We've seen what happens to them. But in a year's time, we'll come back to this place and it will just be bleached white bones. And that was all that will be left. For now, it's just skin, hoof, and a little bit of buffalo. And that's it. And so far, Roger, in answer to your question, no sign of any hyenas having come through. Uh, hyenas, when they come in and they settle, they will have spread the bones far and wide as soon as they come in to start to feed off a carcass. And Roger, I haven't heard any reports of hyena activity. They have been really, really busy, though. They've got a very big job, and that is cleaning up two dead elephants at Buffelshook Dam. Oh, not, sorry, not Buffelshook Dam, at Buffelshook Property. There's two dead elephants there, both of which as far as we know, have died from natural causes. And the hyenas have just moved in, and the hyenas and vultures have been having a field day. The lions haven't even bothered to go there, or at least the females haven't. And we discussed why, and we think that probably because they've got the cubs. They don't want to risk taking cubs. There's the risk of strange males. There's a the risk of other lions coming in. They just can't take the chance, even for a free meal. They've settled for hunting their own. Roger, no sign of any hyena activity, but I haven't been out since yesterday morning. So I was off yesterday afternoon and this morning. And it's amazing how in just that time period, you lose track of what's happening exactly around you. So I haven't seen any hyena tracks. Usually first thing in the morning, you're constantly building up a picture of what's going on. But I haven't done that for the last 24 hours. So it's really nice to be out and back on the vehicle again. I strongly suspect that these lions are at Bufflesook Dam. That is where I expect to see them, unless we have spotted one. I was wondering if they had a hammock up there. Oh, wow. Awesome. That's exactly what that is. Vim has spotted something else fascinating. That indeed is a hammerkop nest. It is the largest nest that is built by one bird. So it obviously doesn't compete with the famous nests of the sociable weaver in the Kalahari and those places. But that enormous nest belongs to one smallish bird called a hammerkop or a hammerhead. 
And that's the first time I've ever noticed that before. That's awesome to know. Now it's absolutely huge. So huge that raptors even build. I thought we only had one of these on the property. Even raptors or storks will build their nests on top of the hummercorp nest. And it's one of the reasons why it, there is this belief that hummercorps are bad luck. That they're actually demons in bird form and that they can shape shift. Because people used to watch, what's that? Oh, it's flies. I wonder if it's occupied. How cool is that? There's the entrance hole. Huh. Be really worthwhile keeping an eye on this particular spot. Maybe next time we do a bushwalk, come here and go and have a look at the hummercorp nest. But yes, local people used to see the birds coming in to the nest site and they've got lots of different false entrances. So it would look like the bird just disappeared and then all of a sudden a, a bird of prey would fall, fly out from the top of the nest or a snake would crawl out of one of the holes because these nests are so big that they provide a perfect little home for lots of different things. And as a result, it led to this belief that hummercorps are shapeshifters, demons. Not, of course, true. They are just birds. They are not bad luck in any way. Okay. I think we should go and look for these lions. And the first place I'm going to go and check is the local waterhole, because I think after a big meal of buffalo over the last two days, some water will be the first thing they think about. And while we do that, let's go back across to James and find out what his spotted cats are doing. Well, there we are, everybody. Three spotted cats. Karula, Shongile, and Hosana. And just sort of over to the left-hand side of your screen there is where Tingana is eating their supper. And they're all looking at the meat. They're sort of... Well, I guess they're rather... Um, uh, they're rather hoping he won't finish their supper completely. That's why they're not looking at us, and I'm afraid I can't get to an angle where we can see them and him. I'm just going to quickly talk to Tax on the radio. Tax, animals on site, only one station has called in coming here, and that was me. No one else, so make your way, and as soon as two of you are here, I'll move out. Tingana is also on site here, but not much visual. Yeah, FM, definitely. Now, B. Wilson and Deborah, of course, you're asking the very good question. Now, are these cubs in danger from Tingana? Um, I'm going to say at this stage, no. Tingana, I'm pretty sure, is the father. Um, even if he isn't, he clearly thinks that he is. Otherwise, I suspect he would have killed these cubs, and she would have taken them away. If they were to approach him... Um, rather like those little cubs approach the male lion this morning, then I think they would be in some kind of trouble. Uh, but they're not going to do that. I think they'll wait here. He's obviously growled at them. We've heard him growling. So I don't think that they're going to try and approach him. And, you know, she would give the signal. If she felt there was any danger from him, she'd just move them away. It's really quite a special thing to see this. Yeah, I mean, look at her coat is totally different from Tingana's. It's just, um, it's less contrasty, if you know what I mean. It's just kind of more uniform. Now, we're not going to have all day here, so let's just enjoy this while we can. I know that there are definitely two people coming, but we'll have about ten minutes 10 or 20, 20 minutes, somewhere around there. So let's just enjoy while we can. So get your questions in now if you want to ask any questions. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. You don't even need to ask us a question. You can just send us a comment about what you think of this lot. Deborah, you say you hope that Tingana's limp is better. Well, I had rather hope Tingana's limp's better too. Uh, he looked to be in pretty good nick, but obviously we didn't see him walk. 
But you know these cats will survive with a limp, they'll survive with all sorts of injuries that you can't believe they will. The big um, injury at the moment that we're talking about, of course, is that little lion cub. Uh, definitely got some kind of nasty injury, possibly from being smacked by one of the females or the males at that buffalo kill. But interesting that they are not there anymore. And maybe they're all at Biffles Hook Dam. That's possible. It is quite impressive to see her flipping over like that. Naturally. Paul, you say you wonder how many times the cat, these cubs have seen Tingana. Um, I'm trying to think. I can't think of an incident, but we do know that Tingana's tracks have certainly been in Little Gauri, which is the reserve to the south of us at the same time as Karula's have. So it's well possible that he's met with them before. And, yeah, I mean, it's such a fascinating thing to me. I don't know if she mated with anyone else. She certainly mated with Tingana. I think it was, what was it, three or four times before, and I mean three or four different full mating sessions before she conceived these two. Now, whether she mated with them Vula sometime on the slide in between that or maybe even the Anderson male, I don't know. But Tingana's reaction here is one of that he thinks he's definitely the father. And that's why these things are fast asleep in his presence. Clearly not worried, but they're certainly not confident enough to go off and try and sort of share the meal with him. That would be very leonine behaviour. These, of course, are not lions at all, are they, Jandre? No, these ones have got the spots. And all is beautifully peaceful. I'm not sure what the temperature is at the moment, but in the sun here it's pretty warm. It's probably sitting at around 24, 25 degrees Celsius which is around about 75. So I'm, I'm told from the final control that it's 23, 73 Celsius and Fahrenheit. Now, Jandri doesn't have the long lens on him, but I don't know if you can see the far cub there, which I think is uh, young Hosanna. But he's breathing very heavily because he's obviously eaten quite a lot of that impala. And I suspect that Karula is rather hoping they'll be able to have a bit more. As opposed to watching Tingana devour all her hard work. Hmm. I'd love to try and move everybody and get a better view, but I don't think we're going to get a better view. <coughs> Now, Rocky Knight, Brent yesterday had a pair of mating leopard tracks, or what he thought were mating leopard tracks, male and female, somewhere around the gate, around the Vuitella gate. Sorry, the sun is quite bright in my eyes. Um, you want to know if it could be these two? No, it couldn't be these two. A, they were not there. They're a long way from there. We know their tracks have been around here, or well, certainly her tracks have been around here for a long time. Um, but also she will not come into estrus until these cubs are either killed, which we hope was not going to happen, obviously, or until they go independent. And that's not going to happen for some time. So, no, the chances of them being the mating pair are almost zero. Look, he's just lifted his head up there. Uh, who the mating pair is, is of course, quite interesting, because I know that uh, Vula while I was on leave was getting in on the action which was nice to see especially as he's no longer a territorial male so his chances to pass on his genes are now going to be inescapably low Little 
little fellow. Hello. They have, you know, they've got larger since I was on leave, if you can believe it. Only two weeks. I suppose that's pretty normal for a young animal. But they've definitely got a bit bigger. That's very unkind of him to lie there, isn't it, Jandre? You may have heard Jandre go, mm. Now, Jean in North Carolina, you want to know if we're on Juma, if these leopards are on Juma, they are absolutely. We're on the pretty close to the southern boundary, only about, say, half a mile as the crow flies to the southern boundary. No, not even that, probably a third of a mile. And so I think they came in from there. We had tracks of Tingana, or certainly a big male, coming in from Ledwood Road, which is on the southeast corner. And he came in from there. But we're definitely on Juma. I'm going to try and sneak forward very slowly and just see if we can't get a view of the little male and possibly a better view of Karula. I've only got about six feet before I'll hit a tree and I'm not going to run it over given how close we are to them. Say so when, John Ree, you've got a shot. Exactly correct because I couldn't go any further. Isn't that nice? There we go. Even with our pea shooter lens. Sarah, you're in Ohio. I don't think I've spoken to you for a while, so thank you for getting hold of us again. Um, you say, hasn't Tingana been known to kill his own cubs? I don't think he's made a habit of it. It's possible that he's killed his own cubs before, but it's also possible that he's killed cubs that he realized were not his, and, you know, so cubs that, he th that perhaps people thought were his, but in fact were not. But I don't think he's made... He certainly has killed cubs before, definitely, and he's killed cubs that uh, we thought were his before. But you can see from this, and obviously they've had an interaction, because, you know, he's come to the kill. You can see from this that they're obviously not particularly threatened by him at all. I think they heard him moving. And that's why they are... That's why they're suddenly heads up. That's lovely. Hmm. Hello, Jeffrey in Durban. A nice question from you about whether or not leopard cubs would ever meet up with other leopard cubs like the lion cubs do. Um, Jeffrey, the answer is probably not. Not impossible, and it does happen sometimes, but it's unlikely. Mainly because they don't live in a pride, you know, so the mothers are seldom around each other. Now that said, it's possible that Shadow could meet up with Karula from time to time. They live next to each other. Shadow has got a cub. Now look at little Shongila there getting up, having a look at the Impala, obviously very hungry still. And so it's possible that they'd meet up and um, then the little cub of shadows and these two would meet up. They wouldn't play like lion cubs do. Well, it's unlikely that they would, and that's simply because they wouldn't know each other, eh? Oh, there we go. She's moving down, sneaking up on Dad. Go ahead. Taxon, go ahead. Sorry, I've just got to talk to Tax on the radio. Negative, you won't see me from the road, you'll have to follow my tracks in. I don't think they're going to get those big land cruisers around here. <laughs> but John, you came in from the other side, did you? Uh, from Mumba Road. Okay. Okay. So she's just looking over to see if 
<laughs> if Dad has left the meal or not, and I suspect from her reaction that he has not, because she would go down there if she felt she could. There she goes. She's moving now. Aaron from Brooklyn, you're a new viewer and it's wonderful to hear from you. Thank you for talking to us and a very good question. Why don't they just get their own prey? Why do they continue to wait for the male to leave theirs? Well, this is their prey. She would have killed it. He's stolen it from them. And I think they've eaten quite a lot of it, just given from the heavy breathing. They also killed a little scrub hare, which is like a rabbit around here this morning. But, you know, the energy expended in catching a, an impala like that is quite a lot. And so they'd, they'd really rather wait to see if there's anything left. I don't think there is going to be. Oof, big thunder. I don't know where it came from. That cloud's disappeared. Well, this is interesting. She's taking a chance now. You see her moving around now. Here she comes. She's coming towards us now. Isn't that wonderful? She's going to come to her brother? No. Not. And Jandri, I'm afraid I don't think I can move any further forward. They are so sweet. Fox hat, a very good one from you while we're sitting here. Well, we're probably about 10 feet from these leopards. You're saying, does turning the engine on and off um, make a difference to uh, their habituation? Definitely it does. Um, but interestingly, they take their cue almost entirely from their mother. If we get too close, they do move away. They're not nearly as cru um, curious as hyena cubs. But at the same time, I mean, we had a sighting of them the other day where I managed to set off the alarm in this car and so you heard me maybe uh, hooting gently at Jamie earlier but um, the car was going beep, 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 beep. they didn't even move they didn't even react and I think that's because they took the cue from their mother go Tex I'm just going to have to help Tax get in here. Tax, just keep coming. You're going to have to try and cross that drainage line. Um, and ideally, you need to do it from, yeah, like the sort of northern side of where you are now. I can hear you. You're not far, but it's quite tough in here. No negative. Tax, if you look in front of you, you'll see a half-dead knob thorn and behind that a marula tree on the other side of the drainage. Can you see that? I'll just turn Taxon on so you can hear him. And you can be part of the conversation. Now, Tax, look due north from where you are. You'll see the drainage line, and there's a marula tree on this side of the drainage and a knobthorn tree on that side of the drainage. And we're just the other side of the marula tree. Further north. West, down there. Okay. Let's just see if we can get him in this way, otherwise we'll send him down to the west. That's quite sweet, isn't it? Tex, just turn off there. I'm going to turn on and then you'll hear the engine. I'm going to turn off again quickly.
Sorry, everybody. I just got to try and help him to get in here. Did you copy that? I oh, crossed just to the east of where we are here, but it's quite difficult. Um, Chandra says Brent came in from the west earlier, so it might be easier to get across further west from where you are. Okay, yeah, I did cross from where you are. I can see you now. I crossed further. I crossed further east from where you are now. I can see you. Anyway, while they are trying to get in here, we'll just enjoy the leopards. All right, let's let's go across to Jamie while I try and help these chaps get in here, get an update from her, and we'll come back to the leopards before we have to leave. Sounds like a really difficult position that those leopards have managed to pick, and Taxon's definitely going to need some help getting in there. No, no luck with the lion search. I'm disappointed. I was convinced we were going to come round the corner to Bivelzook Dam and found them all sprawled across with giant bellies just sitting next to the dam. But that, alas, was not to be the case. And their tracks, there's one or two of them coming backwards and forwards from the kill to the dam. But there's no indication that the entire pride went in that direction. So where have our lions gone? There's one thing that's bugging me. And that is the fact that there's still meat left on this carcass and those vultures are not on it. And it makes me wonder that those lions aren't hiding somewhere very close by, still being a bit defensive instinctively, even though there's nothing really left for them to feed off. They might still be protecting the carcass from the vultures. And the, the fact that we've got such a collection of them and it's not just that one hooded vulture, when I've gone round to the other side, I notice that there's about 20 vultures hanging around the area, but they're all in the trees. They're not down at the carcass. Unless they've already had a chance to feed and they've got full crops, I don't think so. I'm going to go back and investigate. For now, let's head back to James and his leap of leopards. And it is a leap of leopards, this, everybody. You've got a view there. Um, we still haven't managed to get those two chaps in, I'm afraid. Okay, let me just quickly talk to them again. I'm on the western side of the drainage line, guys, the western side. You have to cross the drainage from there or come in from Mumba. But even if you cross, you can cross further down towards the Mulwati or up towards um, up towards the Drakensberg Road. But I'm on the southwestern side, northwestern side, sorry, of the drainage. I'm not sure why they're struggling to get in here. I think it's because their vehicles are so very big in comparison with ours. Makes it quite difficult for them. Anyway, here we are. Gives us a bit more time with them, which is wonderful. And Karula just snuck up towards the drainage. I think to have a look um, and one of the cubs came to say hello to her and she kind of gave a bit of a hiss at him and then then she moved off I think to look to see if Tingana was still there perhaps eating her hard won meal it's the most wonderful peaceful afternoon Marianne, you want to know if, if um, Tingana will hoist that kill and pull it up into the tree, um, or will he, he'll just leave it there. I, I think he's going to leave it. I don't think there's too much le of it left. Um, I think he's pilfered it from her, and so he's. I think he'll probably just finish it there, to be honest. He 
he might just, you know, if he's on his way patrolling or something like that, he might leave it earlier and then she'll, she might hoist it up into this tree. Um, but hoisting it, remember, would have made no difference to whether she had it stolen from her or not, because almost certainly uh, Tingana would have managed to pinch it from her in the tree as well. And I suspect that's one of the reasons that these leopards sometimes don't hoist their kills. It's because one of the greatest scavengers of their kills are bigger leopards. And so although putting it in a tree does keep it safe from hyenas and lions, uh, it doesn't keep it safe from other leopards. And we've watched Karula have kills stolen by Mvula, uh, by, uh, in a tree, you know, seemingly safe in the tree. And the kill got stolen by her one-time consort. And all the way in the background, other than the sound of Aubrey coming to the sighting, is the little white-browed scrub robin. It's about the only bird song at the moment on this very peaceful Monday afternoon. I was just saying to uh, VM earlier this morning, Jean-Dre, that, um, you know, it'd be much nicer to be sitting in traffic somewhere, don't you think? Yeah. Perhaps in an office reading a legal document. Wouldn't that have been much nicer than doing this? This is an awful way to spend a Monday afternoon. For those of you who don't know me too well, that's called sarcasm. <laughs> and it is, of course, my favourite form of wit. Yeah, just look to your left there, Orbs. All right, everyone. Sorry, it's tax to your left tax. We're going to have to leave these beautiful leopards and we are going to leave them here in the capable hands of Taxon. And while we move away, um, let's go back to Jamie, find out what she's doing, and I will see you once we're out of the sighting. Well, James heads away from the leopards for now. I'm going back to investigate where this carcass was because I'm not a hundred percent convinced that these lions have moved all that far away. I think if they had, the vultures would still be feeding off that carcass, especially with the number of vultures that are here. And so, I've come in from a slightly different angle just to double, triple check that these lions aren't just hiding with giant bellies somewhere in the shade where we couldn't quite see them before. This was the original approach to the carcass before we found a different and much easier route in. And poor Brent had to try and find his way down here in the dark the other day. But there's the carcass hiding behind the trees and now is there a lion hiding somewhere here? Is that why the vultures have been so reticent to make an approach? Go check here quickly. Let's poke our nose over the side. I'm reluctant to try and walk in this drainage line because I know that this is where the lionesses have been keeping their cubs safe. And I don't want to actually scare the cubs at all. If they have them somewhere here, I can't guarantee that they don't. If I knew it was just the Inkahumas and the Birmingham boys with full bellies, I'd be far more comfortable about walking. But with the little cubs, they tend to get very nervous with people on foot. And then there's, of course, the risk of coming upon little cubs and mom not being terribly impressed. And Snoop, welcome back, as always, on the back of our sunset safari. Snoop would like to know what happened to the little lion cub that was injured and how it was injured. We don't know. We have absolutely no idea. I felt as though that lion cub looked a bit thinner than the others, but I'm not 100% sure of that. I don't want to cause distress where I needn't. It might have been... I don't see any lions hiding in this drainage system. It might have been from an injury from the, to the cub as a result of getting a bit too bold from feeding off the carcass and perhaps got a bat by one of the adults. That does happen. It might have been an injury that happened well if it fell. In, lion cubs get injured. 
And I've seen a lion cub with what I thought was a broken leg go on to heal and reach adulthood and be absolutely fine. So there's by no means cause for panic just yet. I don't know where it is now. Probably with the other lion cubs. Mom's not going to leave it behind. Mom will stay and look after it and make sure that it's safe and hope and that it can keep up with the rest of the group. So it will be fine. And that's where being a social cat comes in hugely handy. Because injuries like that, that might be a death sentence for something like a leopard or a lion, oh, sorry, for a leopard or a cheetah, for a lion, they've got a far better chance of surviving because they've got the rest of the pride to help them out. And as long as they can still walk and keep up with the lions, they will be okay. So no, definitely no reason to be too distressed just yet about the state of that little one. I think it's going to be just fine. Can you tell me how these lions disappeared? Because they didn't walk on this road. They didn't walk on Hy One of them walked on Hyena Road, but up to Buffles Hook, and they did it... I don't think it was from, yes from today. So where on earth did these lions go? And why won't the vultures go down to the carcass? One more time. We're going to drive in one more time to this carcass and just see if I didn't miss something. Perhaps they're sitting on top of that drainage line wall. Oh, in we go again. And if we don't have any luck here, well, there's exciting news coming from Cheetah Plains. So I might be going there if we aren't successful here. Uh, that was a much better angle that I approached that at this time round. I just would have expected to see more vultures pecking away at the face. There's still meat left there. Perhaps there's a male hanging round. Too lazy to move. I don't think we missed anything though. Alright, back to square one. There is a delightful scent in this drainage line. Delicious smell of rotting buffalo. Here we go. Okay, we might lose signal as this antenna goes down. Hopefully we don't. Okay. Now I feel better because now I feel like we've very thoroughly checked the spot and there really isn't anything here. There's total silence. Let me just chat to James ever so briefly on the Game Drive channel since we might be able to coordinate a tracking expedition to try and see him. There's no lines here. I wonder if they're not just that side, on that side of the drainage line wall. James for Jamie. But James, I've checked Hyena Road. There's one set of tracks going north, but they don't look like they're that fresh. And I've also checked Bubbles Look Dam, one or two tracks coming backwards and forwards from when they went to drink there when they were still feeding. I don't know where they've gone from here. Copy that, thank you. I'm going to go check Gory Plan. They might still be in the drainage somewhere. Uh, the tracks that I saw on Hyena Road, I, can, I now know, are the mail that Vernon saw this morning. That's why they weren't terribly clear and they didn't look fresh, because they've been partly driven over. Obviously the vultures soaring overhead. Well, I guess that's that. I guess the carcass is just... They can't be bothered to go to the effort of trying to get into the bit in between bits of the vertebra because there's enough meat left on that face still. Maybe it's deceptive, maybe there's hardly anything left. 
gruesome and yet fascinating at how quickly it's gone from living, breathing animal to skin and some bones. Half the rib bones are gone. Quite incredible. Okay. Right, now I feel better. We've double checked. There's no lions here. Let's go back and check in some of the other directions that they might have walked on. Because there's... Unless there's somewhere on this other side of the strainage line wall. It might be worth going to check Quarry Pan or somewhere similar. If I walk over there and onto this dam, having now driven, that's where we drove in to watch this buffalo kill, and that's where I had to reverse away from the buffalo and the lioness that was on top of it. If I walk over there now, and the lionesses are lying in the drainage line below it, they're going to feel very seriously trapped. I'm listening for cub calls as well, but I don't think they're going to keep... I don't think they're going to keep the cubs near a carcass with hyenas coming and going. All right, we're going to go out, look for these lions. In the meantime, let's go over to James, who has got one of the other birds of prey. We had three bateliers on this. One of them took fright, and now it's two, but on a beautiful tree quite close to the road. I think this is, this is definitely two of the pair that lives or nests on Leadwood Road, and I think that other one is probably a juvenile from the that the two of them gave birth to some time ago. Beautiful birds. <laughs> and just sunning themselves quietly. Now, of course, they would love to have got in on the action at the buffalo. But their vultures got in there well before they did. And so they wouldn't have even bothered. Isn't that lovely? It is perfectly, perfectly kind of back, or backgrounded by the blue sky, and it's quite a pale sky today. It's not that deep blue sort of winter sky we're used to. And there they are, in their dead trees, surveying the land for dead things. They also eat, of course, living things, once they've killed them themselves, like lizards and snakes sometimes, and small mammals, like gerbils, scrub hares, small children. Not really small children, they don't eat small children. I'm just being facetious. <laughs> that. Shaking their feathers, just lining everything up, possibly thinking about taking off, going for a small flight. Now, of course, what they see is probably profoundly different from what we see. Their eyesight is spectacularly good, far better than ours could ever be. And the amount that they'll be seeing perched up here, looking off to the east and west, is, I would imagine, in much sharper detail than we're able to see it. And not only that, I would also think that it's probably, um, that I'm sure they can see a lot further as well. But these birds of prey do tend to have very chilled out kind of lifestyles, so they do a bit of flying about the place. They fly a lot, they don't fly very actively. They just sort of hang beautifully in the air, low down, and then they do quite a lot of sitting. I know some people like that. Quite a few, actually. That, of course, if we sit here for long enough, will become quite a pleasant sunset shot. We'll just reverse a bit and have the sun going down behind them. But I'm sure by then they will have moved on. And I don't think we're going to wait here for an hour, do you, Jandre? Do you think you might go to sleep if I sat here for an hour in the sun? He's nodding. Oof. Gorgeous red face there. And wings. 
sticking out over the non-existent tail. Sitting in a knob thorn tree, killed by elephants, not intentionally of course, but they pulled the bark off to eat it, and that sealed the knob thorn's fate. And so it will stand as a skeleton, probably for, I don't know, maybe five years or so, and then it's not a tough tree like a leadwood, and so it'll probably fall over. Brilliant. Okay, let's carry on, and we'll just see if we can't give Jamie a hand with those, with those lions. Um, not because Jamie needs a hand with the lions, but because we're in that area anyway, and we were the last ones to see them. Oh, here's one I can actually ask. Um, James Richard, you want to know what the local word for a shang, for the Shangan word for a battalier is? It's shimungwe. That's shimungwe. And you want to know if there's a local word just for bird of prey, like raptor? Um, no, I don't think there is. Uh, there's a word for bird, obviously, that's shinyanyana, or many birds, shinyanyana. And these ones are called shimungwe or shimungwe. So if I wanted to say two battalions, I would say Swimungwe Swimbiri. Hello Sabrina, age 12, you want to know if these, uh, these battalier eagles would eat vultures? No, they wouldn't. Um, I haven't really told you how big they are. The battalier is about this big, so about, what do we say, that's almost two feet tall, probably two feet tall. And Sabrina, the vultures are a bit bigger, uh, so those big white-backed vultures are probably two and a half feet tall, and they're a bit heavier as well. The hooded vultures, which is the other kind of vultures we saw yesterday, the ones that were eating the disgusting lion dung, they're about the same size. So they wouldn't try and take on something like that. It would just be, there would be too much risk involved in taking something much bigger than them, especially when they're, they're not designed to do that. They're designed to uh, scavenge themselves and also to just hunt much smaller prey. Go ahead, I'm just talking to Aubrey. Um, Orbs of you with her, it's just down from her in uh, the eastern side or the southeastern side of where she is sitting um, in a big thicket there uh, with Tangana. All right, let's go and get an update. Oh, just before we do that, there we go. There's a Nyala. And while we are trying to just help Aubrey find the kill, uh, let's go back to Jamie and get a quick update from her. Go again, Orbs. No update from my side. I suspect that those lionesses are just, they've moved their cubs a little bit away and they're lying up with very, very full bellies somewhere in the shade. And I think we're probably going to move on if we don't have any luck around Gwari Pan, which is where I'm heading to next. We're probably going to move on and start heading towards Cheetah Plains. One, because there's a surprise there, and two, because I would actually really like to go to Cheetah Plains. I feel like I haven't been there in ages, and it's pro probably about ten or so days since I was last there. Now, I'm going to go back and pay a visit to Cheetah Plains, see if maybe the grass is a bit greener there after all the rain that we had, because it's not just my imagination, particularly in this area that's full of baboon's tail, but it is going so green. And it's such a pleasure. Just look at the, I mean, this is just one spot. Just look at how much green growth there is. The baboon's tail have been the first plants to react. And apparently James is pointing them out a lot on the sunrise safari, but it's not just them. There is fresh green grass growing in patches around us. And whilst we've still got a long way to go until the end of winter and the beginning of the rainy season, this certainly feels like a sort of a fresh spring of hope. I really enjoy it. And it's definitely changed the colour of a bush in what feels like overnight. It's not quite, it's probably about three days. You get that delayed effect as the rain soaks into the soil and the plants start to respond to it. Those of you who've been watching over the last few weeks, you'll understand exactly what I mean, though, about what a profound change it is to see this much green. The lions haven't come this way either. 
I'm relatively convinced in my own mind that they're in that drainage system. In that river, basically, that whole area is made up of a whole load of river, dry riverbeds that crisscross throughout the block. And it's the perfect spot to go and hide if you've got little cubs and you want some shade, you've got full bellies, they don't really have to rush anywhere, there's still puddles of water. I suspect that's where they're all hiding. And it might be nice to head across to the eastern part of our traverse area, see if any rain, any of that rain that we saw fly by has reached that particular part of the Sabi sand, or if it was restricted to the Kruger area. we're heading to now, or about to get to now, just checking very carefully in here, is one of the lion's favorite spots, the Inkuhumas in particular. When I very first started working here, oof, bumpy, they had a buffalo kill in this exact spot. Let's go see if there's water here. Might sort of stir them into moving in this direction. But if they did, then they certainly didn't be, be, use the roads. There's water here. But no sign of any lions coming to drink. Just one noisy turtle dove. Making his way. perfect spot for a turtle dove to come and drink. Most of the mammals you'll find at this point will ignore this water. It doesn't look very appetizing, does it? Even to that turtle dove that's trying to find a place in where it doesn't have to get its feet too muddy. Oh, no, that won't do. Yes, no. I'll pop. Maybe there is a bit better. No, nope. rejected. Oh, maybe actually you've changed my mind. There we go. This is actually a really awesome view of this bird. Oh, it was a really awesome view of that bird. It's gone now. As, uh, what I was going to say is there are very few mammals that would be... Uh, they'd be happy to drink from that water if that was all that there was. But it's muddy, it's green, it's brackish. It's not really what they're looking for, for a nice refreshing drink. And speaking of our bird species, and the rain, and the summer, and the change of season, HKP, not just yet. So HKP was wondering if it isn't the time for the Woodlands Kingfisher to come back to the Kruger National Park. No, it isn't. Um, we're still far too early in the year. We'll only see them towards November, December, depending on the various areas and where gets their rain first. So they arrive at different parts of the country at different times. A Woodlands Kingfisher, by the way, is an inter-African migrant, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this particular bird. I haven't got my bird book because I was worried it was going to rain. I didn't bring anything that couldn't be quickly sheltered away from the storm. That didn't happen. Nevertheless, I don't have my bird book to show you a picture, but it is a really beautiful bird. And it's one that, when it arrives, everybody knows about it. One day they're not there, the next day they're there, and they are filling the air with the sounds of their chip calls. Very, very vocal birds and you find that you miss them until they've been with you for about two weeks and they're continuously doing that chip chirr outside your window at all hours of the day and it's full moon nights as well. Not yet, but that is something that you have to look forward to over the coming months, HKP. On our way now, I think, to Cheetah Plains. We'll go and see what we can find there and maybe show you the surprise that I have up my sleeve while we head across there. Let's go to James for an update. Well, we've come into the area where the lions were. I know Jamie has been here, and now she's off to find you a surprise at Cheetah Plains, which sounds very exciting indeed. Um, I think we're going to do a little bit of a search around here as well, just in case 
they, one of them doesn't pop out onto the road on his way to Buffalo's Hook perhaps for a drink or one of the lionesses decides she's uh, rather tired of spending time with her cubs and needs a bit of alone time, we might find one of them popping out at the dam or walking up onto the road. The number of times, and I know that you've heard Brent say this, the number of times um, we find tracks on top of our own vehicle tracks sort of crossing behind us is, is uh, well, it's just, it's too many to be funny, actually. So we'll go around there now and just have a look-see. I suspect quite strongly that they've gone off towards Hyena Road, which is... Um, well, it's kind of between where the kill is and, and the dam and getting a car in there is almost impossible and especially trying to maintain any form of signal with a car in there is nigh on impossible. I haven't found a lion, genre, but I have found you a diker, but that's only because you're a special friend to me. Unfortunately, oh, there it is. I can see it. Can you see it? Just right hand side of the dead tree. You should get it now. With this powerful lens. Look at that, hmm? Jandre, have you ever had a sighting of a diker more better than that? It really is. Framed by the tree. Let's just hope a Nat Geo Wild executive is watching. Because you will be whipped off to permanent employment with them immediately. Exactly. It was very clever of me. Right, excellent diker sighting. Let's move on. That's the common diker, of course. And unfortunately, possibly, I mean, I don't want to cast aspersions on the common diker, but it is a bit common. And there's some very, very beautiful dikers around. You get something called a zebra diker. You get a blue diker down there. In fact, I'll show you a picture of a blue diker, because I recently saw one, and that was on the golf course while I was looking for a ball in the deep bush of the Eastern Cape and I saw a magnificent blue diker. I shall try and find it in this book without having a crash. Oh, I did have it. Here it is. Let me stop the car. Um, I found the black one, not the blue one. I promise it's here, everybody. I promise. There it is. It's that very strange looking thing there, but it's actually a better color than that. It's a really deep kind of um, bluey, uh, bluey black color, especially down in the Eastern Cape. Isn't that nice? And look at the zebra diker, just have a look at that. And unfortunately only found in that bulge of West Africa around Ghana and the Ivory Coast. And that's not really a place you want to be going at the moment. Wonderful. So we've got the common diker. Now, in South Africa, one of our official languages, of course, is Afrikaans. And Afrikaans has many wonderful words that are not really directly translatable to English or any other language. Um, one of them, which carries, which is translatable, but carries a slightly uh, more effective meaning, I feel, is the word common, which means common. But if you say that something is common out here, you really, it's, it's said with with quite a lot of um, derision. Hey, Jandre? I'm just trying to think of something that's common about you, but I can't think of anything that's common about you. is not common at all. He's very unusual. Um, it's not always a good thing. I mean, some bad smells are unusual. Uh, but I'm not comparing Jandre with a bad, with a bad smell. Genre is certainly not common. The light is turning rather gorgeously golden at the moment as Jamie heads to Cheetah Plains at high speed. Now, the very complex set of drainage lines that lead from uh, Buffalo's Hook Dam uh, kind of starts here and then it cuts across and so into this area here it's a it's almost impossible to get vehicles into so we're hoping they're not in there now Trisha you're wondering when these lines are going to kill again and it's I would say they will try and kill again 
actively in about four days time maybe three days that said if they are walking around at night uh, doing some territorial marking and something an opportunity happens to present itself then absolutely they will go for it now what interests me and I'm just going to ask Kirsty to confirm this were there any vultures at the buffalo carcass because I don't see any in the trees here and I find that bizarre no vultures on the ground none of them in the trees and there's still meat on the carcass yeah maybe they gave up yeah there was as Jandre says there was a dead elephant on or there is a dead elephant on Buffalo's hook and it's quite possible that they decided that was better value I just, I'm, it depresses me that I tell you because I think it's because they, uh, there simply aren't the numbers of vultures that there could be. There's no ways that a, a buffalo carcass that left alone without the lions would, uh, that, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago when I started doing this sort of a job, that vultures wouldn't have been on there. Anyway, we'll go and have a look see. We'll have one pass at the dam and then go and just look up onto that bank around the carcass. So we really do need to keep a sharp eye out here. And there are some vultures in front there, three of them. I think Jamie did probably drive this area flat. What have you got? Yes, got three vultures there, more of them at the dam, it looks like. I'll just quickly show you these ones. I'm not going to tarry long here. Those are three white backed vultures over there. There they are. There's another one in front of us here, and this was the tree that contained 22 vultures in it this morning. That's it there. That had 22 vultures in it. It's now got one vulture in it. There we are. So we'll just have a quick look. A quick look at the dam. And then decide from there. Oh, um, Dave in California, you're wondering about how long it would take to fill these dams if we have a normal rainy season. I, I, I think that it's, it's most likely that it's, it's, sorry, I'm being distracted by the ear, my earpiece here, game drive radio. Um, the, what was I going to say here? <laughs> being completely distracted. Um, right, it's 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 the amount of water that falls out the sky rather than the sort of time. So I think that you'll find that a full season's rain of good rain, so about 600 millimeters, or um, what's that, 60 centimeters, is 24 inches of rain. I think that will put a pretty good amount of water into Bivelsook Dam. A really good rainy season of about a thousand millimeters, which would be exceptional, uh, that's almost double, that would really fill all the dams and maintain them um, for more than one season. Sorry, it was just Herbert on the radio there, and I wondered where he was. Now, any lions in these little crevices lying on the wall?
lines here. I find that odd. There. What's that? Uh, binoculars. No, it wasn't a tree, it was moving. Don't say it was blowing in the wind. <coughs> Stop coughing. I can't see. It's a stien book. Oh, very exciting. You won't be able to see it from here, everybody, with this lens, I'm afraid. All right, no lions here. So what we'll do, I think, is we'll go down sort of via Hyena Road. I'm not sure how Wendy's signal will be there. Kirsten, do you remember how it was last time? Not good, jean -Dre. Well, let's try it. Let's try it anyway. We can always go to Jamie if we have to. And I'd quite like to go back to the carcass, because I wonder if they won't come out of the bushes. I wonder if they aren't somewhere in that very difficult area, because there are no vultures on the ground. Because it would be nice to see those little lion cubbies again. What did we call them? Oh yes, we called them Jerry, Kirsty, and Louise. That's right. It would be nice to see Jerry, Kirsty, and Louise again. <laughs> Okay, let's head across to Jamie, see where she is in her travails to, not her travails, her travels to Cheetah Plains. And on our travels to Cheetah Plains, we are well on our way. It's much, much windier this side, which is unexpected. But we are between the Mulwanini on Gauri Main and the Cheetah Plains driveway. So on our left lies Torchwood, where we have ventured on to once or twice um, with a little bit of permission, but Torchwood, we always talk about the animals going into Torchwood. It's the property that lies to the east of our boundary between us and Kruger National Park. And then on our right is Chitwa, the main part of the leopard Tundi. That's her territory in that particular area. And she even gave birth to and denned her cubs underneath a room or room number nine. I believe it was, at the Chitwa Lodge. They had to shut the room down, as you do when there's a female leopard with small babies underneath the deck. I think she has since moved them. Now, there's always a chance whenever we head to Cheetah Plains of encountering them. They're still a little bit young. I'm not sure exactly when they were born, but they must be coming up to two months now. So there's still that, that prospect of Tundi's little ones. Wow. And lots and lots and lots of impala. Hello, Mpalala. Looking beautiful in the afternoon sun. And actually, for this number of Impala, there's probably about 50 or so here, making quite a lot of rustling noise as they move through all of the falling leaves. I think that Viam's point, since he got back from leave, is absolutely correct. They do seem to be forming larger herds now. That's to be expected because they are no longer rutting. So there's no longer that disparate nature to the division, with the rams being part of the bachelor herds and the females being off with whichever large ram has managed to collect them, add them to his harem, his collection. They're now all mixed together, but also I think the drought is pushing them into bigger and bigger groups. Or at least the dryness of the season. We've got rams of all sizes, like this roughly three-year-old ram. And then lots and lots of ewes around as well. And all beneath the protective boughs of one of my favorite trees out here, which is the torchwood. Balan, you'll hear us refer to it as Torchwood, Balanites, it's also called the Green Thorn, the Y Thorn, and lots of different names. It's one of James's favourite trees to climb. And you know the drought is bad when the elephants are targeting the torchwoods, which is what they have been doing. 
We saw that one with Brent the other morning, desperately reaching up to try and get hold of that particular tree. And we'd heard a report, it was weird that that sighting happened with Brent that morning because the night before we were with friends of ours who reported seeing exactly the same thing, elephants desperately reaching up to the top of the branches. And torchwoods tend to grow in this way. They've got a very, very big, long main stem and then the branches spread out much higher up when they're roughly this, when they get to the age that this one is. They're beautiful trees and home to lots of animals living in the curves of the bark. Here you can see why some, it's sometimes called a Y thorn. A lot of those thorns, like the one in the middle there, kind of split off into a Y shape. Actually, technically, they're not thorns, they're spines. They're modified branches. Beautiful tree. All right, let's carry on. I still need to get close enough so that I can talk on the game drive radio for your surprise. Not telling you anything more. I like to keep things interesting every now and again. And it'll also be nice to go through and go to those big open areas of cheetah plains. There's always the chance of, well, I'm not going to say anything more because if I tell you too much what we could see, then you're going to guess what we are going to see. One of the things we always talk about and will happen one day on our live safari, because statistically it has to happen, is the answer to Andrew's question, which is, has anyone seen the cheetah taking down an ostrich? Now, I've seen it, I've been fortunate enough to see it before when I worked in the Kalahari. I have not seen it here yet. We have seen one, I was with Dave on Cheetah Plains, one attempted cheetah hunt. It was aborted relatively quickly when the wildebeest caught on that they were being hunted or stalked by the cheetah and they dashed off as quickly as possible and the cheetah half-heartedly ran after them and then gave up relatively quickly. But Andrew, it will happen. One day it will happen live on our safaris. It has to, statistically. And cheetah are specialized ostrich catchers. And they're generally the only one of the big cats that are fast enough to keep pace with the ostrich. They just have to get close enough so that they still have that element of surprise before they manage to, because the, the, the ostrich is renowned for its stamina, the cheetah is absolutely not. I'm trying to show you these wood hoopoos, but they keep disappearing. I think they've all disappeared now. Oh, hold on. They're, hmm. They're playing very tricky. Viam's managed to spot one. Well done, Viam. One of my favorite birds to stop and look at because they're so thoroughly entertaining. But they're being very inconspicuous right now. Just the glimpse of the red bull every now and again. And I know that for those of you who are building up your bird list, that's one that we have seen relatively regularly. We're starting to struggle for some of you to find you or to get new birds on camera. But for newer viewers, we always encourage people to start up a bird list. Keep track of all of the different birds that you get to see on camera. And the green wood hoopoe is one of them. And I can hear them calling. Mm. Playing hard to get. Let's carry on though. As I said, I need to get closer to the sighting so that I can call myself in and find out if we can get to join it. But yes, for those of you building up your bird lists, it is exciting because summer is coming, might not be quite as soon as, <laughs> as the woodlands kingfishers coming back just yet, but the summer birds will start returning slowly but surely and maybe then we can start to add. Some, some of our viewers have lists that number over 200 birds, others are sitting at 150. You start 
to get to those numbers and it becomes more and more tricky for us to add to them. I'm going to hop out of the vehicle and pick up the rubbish that's in the middle of the road. While I do that, let's go back to James and find out how his lion hunt is going. Hello everybody again. We just came to the area, the other side of the drainage here. And I'm afraid there's no sign except for a very substantial uh, pile of lion dung, which um, Jean-André very kindly pointed out to me. He said, stop, 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 stop. I thought he'd spotted the lions. So I said, what? And he said, there's a very large lion scat. And of course, you don't want to drive over a lion scat because then every time the wheel turns, there's a, you get this disgusting whiff. Anyway, we're going to head back up onto Hyena Road. That's literally just over there at that big tree. But what I want to, that's no good for a silhouette, is it yet? I'm trying to get a beautiful silhouette of the vultures on that tree there. But this is where the male was this morning. This, the male came through here this morning. And this is where Vernon left him. But obviously they have moved on. Anyway, we'll try and quietly make our way out of here. But it's not going to be easy given the amount of foliage that the elephants have left strewn about the place. That would be the path. But Jean Ray, do you think we'll... <laughs> I don't think we'll move that thing. Um, not really sure how we're going to do this, actually. We might have to come back the way we came. In which case, you'll almost certainly lose signal. We'll just try one foray up here, otherwise we'll have to come back the way we came. We obviously don't want to do too, any damage. And most of the trees, just to keep you posted, if you are a new viewer, most of the trees that we drive over will pop up behind us. And those that don't are normally kind of encroacher species like um, Acacia exuvialis or the flaky thorn or the strychnos bushes. They do unfortunately pop up. Yeah, we'll try and get through here. Jean-André, just watch yourself here. This is going to possibly take the skin off your arm. Um, but don't worry, I do have a first aid kit with me. And so we'll sew your arm back on. That would be quite a nice addition to Safari Live, don't you think? Surgery Live. I think I'm going to suggest that, actually. <laughs> do you think... Do you think Surgery Live would have a following, John Dre? Uh, yeah, uh, I think it would for those who... So you know that we make these little highlights reels and we put them on Facebook and we put them on social media. And the lion kill, which I didn't see until this morning, um, uh, unbelievable sighting, incredible stuff, uh, but quite gory and quite difficult to watch and not particularly attractive to see, uh, but amazing to see. And that, by the end of one day, having been shared on social media, I think had some very, uh, what we would consider quite a low number of hits uh, or views on social media. And then we posted, I think this morning, a video of the little cubs uh, that we had at the, at the kill site today and that immediately took off. People started sharing it and watching it and enjoying it and I just think it's amazing. People are fascinated by little baby animals. We are, I don't know, we're just completely drawn to them far more so than we are to death and destruction which I know given the state of the world today it wouldn't seem necessarily true but I think it's quite nice that actually that we we're not necessarily drawn to the death and destruction of that kill, but much rather to the new life that was represented by those little cubs. Is that any good to you, Jean Ray, or was it a hopeless silhouette? It's a little bit sharp still. A little bit sharp still. I'll just give you a quick look at that white backed vulture as it watches the sunset from its perfect little perch. I will take a rank average photograph of it. That Andre will then critique for me. There we go. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Rain, you're 16 years old and you ask a very, very good question. You say, would, they, would vultures eat at night? And the answer, Rain, is no, probably not. Um, because they can't take off at night, or they can, but it's very difficult for them to take off at night. And so I think what you'll find is that they wouldn't eat at night. But what they would do is wait around over a kill at night. So if that makes sense at all. They wouldn't necessarily try and eat at night, but they'd wait around at night. And the other reason they wouldn't eat at night is that they don't see so well at night. And that means that if a lion or a hyena was to come bucketing out of the bushes at them, well, then they would be in quite a lot of trouble. All right, let's move up a little bit. Thank you, Jean-André. Wasn't... Hey, you want to see the photo? Jean-André wants to see my photo, everybody. And because my ego is so enormous, I'm going to show it to you. But then Jean-André will quickly sort that out for me. There you are, Jean-André. Huh? Not too bad. Huh? There you are, Jean-André. Huh? Not too bad. Huh? That's quite pretty. I mean, with some heavy editing, it could be usable. <laughs> All right, on we go. Here is Hyena Road up in front of us, and there are no lions here. All right, Jamie is now on the plains. Um, well, I think she's been there for a while, but we'll go and catch up with her and find out perhaps what her surprise is. And luckily for us, there doesn't seem to be too much of a queue to see this particular surprise. And so we can head off straight to that direction. In the unfortunate case, I managed to pick up the litter that was on the road. It appears to be a split rubbish bag. It must have fallen off the back of the retrieval truck. It's very smelly. It's in my footfall right now, and it's very smelly. As long as we keep going forwards, it's absolutely fine. But as soon as I stop, the scent of, of fresh rubbish starts to sort of waft. I probably should have dumped a lodge when I came through in this direction. But we're in a hurry. Going to that surprise in a moment. I'm heading to a place on Cheetah Plains called Juma Dam, which is interesting for those of you who know the history. Because of course, we operate on a place called Juma. The two places are connected because the original Cheetah Plains. It was the owned by the and fascinatingly enough, this used to be the end of the Sabi Sand. Juma, Torchwood, all of those places, they didn't exist as the Sabi Sand as we know it. Of course they existed, but they were farmland. And they were farms and neighbours, but they were not open to the Kruger National Park and they were not part of the Sabi Sand 40 years ago. Only in the last few decades that they were added to the list. And I met somebody recently, well, I didn't meet him, I, I found out recently that a friend of mine, a great tracker who works where I used to work, called Patson. Patson, who studied from the great Renius, who came to give us tracking lessons, he um, used to live here and walk, walk all the way to a township called Dixie supplies and then all the way back to Cheetah Plains which in a straight line is very far and he said he used to take a little a little wheelbarrow to go and get what a lot of the local people as part of their staple diet called pup or maize meal it's sort of the equivalent rough equivalent of polenta go and get and collect 50 kilograms of pup and drag it all the way back on this really long walk in a wheelbarrow. Yeah, in a wheelbarrow. I don't know if he said it was a wheelbarrow or a cart. We had a slight, um, we had a slight sort of language barrier there, but it was, it was an interesting description. Either way, 50 kilograms is a lot of weight 
to carry that distance. Oh, looky here. Oh, Sean, I'm gonna have to tell him to keep it a secret. Hello, everybody. How's it? Hello, hello. How's it, Sid? Are you? Good, thanks. Hi, everyone. Oh. Awesome. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Cool. Thanks so much. Okay. Cheers, guys. Bye. Enjoy your drive. Shame. The poor guests get really nervous. They get upset about being on camera, which is why, of course, we keep it off them. We don't zoom in or anything like that. I assume we're going this way. We'll find out. Yes, we're going that way. Yes, we are indeed. Oh, wonderful. <gasps> Look at this. This is awesome. There you go. Might not have been the lions we were trying to find, but we have such a cool surprise for you. Look, and they're having so much fun. Piles of cubs, look at them. They're all having this amazing time. I can't believe there aren't more people here. The Styx cubs in action. <laughs> Pouncing. We do all get a little bit gooey when it comes to sites like this. I can't, we've got three different groups all playing with each other. Absolutely awesome. Well, the Styx Cubs seem to have two different age groups. The older ones, like the ones that you're seeing at the moment, and then the slightly smaller ones. This is only the second time I've ever seen them. Look at your little ones. You're too cute. This is absolutely awesome. I'm so glad we could get to get here before the sun goes down because we definitely can't spotlight them. Oh, this is why it's great to grow up a lion cub. So many cousins to play with, cous cousins and siblings, oh, pinned. <laughs> I'm so glad they're spending more time on cheetah planes now. Look at them little bundles of mischief. Oh, got your tail. <laughs> the little one wants to go back to the adults and the older one will let it. <laughs> little boy. <laughs> I just want to go back to mommy. Oh, one of them's made a, a happy escape, but has been distracted by a stick. The other one still can't get up. Maybe distraction oh there's too many things to watch happening right now there's so many things going on little bundle of cubs oh. we are so lucky it feels like it's just cubs galore at the moment and I for one am absolutely loving it Baby cats everywhere. Now we just need some cheetah cubs to c complete the collection. Now, unlike the Nkuhuma cubs, the Styx cubs, whilst equally healthy and vibrant and clearly full of life, they are a little bit more mangy than the Nkuhuma cubs. They do have mange, or what looks like to me to be mange. Arr. Fierce, pre fierce predator teeth coming out. The body language of that little one, it's getting cross now. Ears back, tail thrashing, it's not happy. It's had enough of this game. Backtracking. Too much. Calling mom. <laughs> Another one bounding in. Tasha, 
They're not related, well, actually they are related, I suppose, to the Gorma cubs. They most likely share the fathers. Uh, the Birmingham boys are in charge of the sticks, or dominant over the sticks and the Gormas, so they've mated with both. Standing by. Hey, Sean. Oh, that one. <laughs> Sorry, guys, just on the game drive comms here. Sorry. So they are related because they share, most likely, share fathers in some way. One of the Birmingham boys will be the father of at least some of these cubs and vice versa with the Ngohumas. What I was thinking, Tasha, which made me say no initially was, of course, the moms. But what I was going to go into was the possibility that at some point the sticks and the Ngohumas would be related in some way if you were to go far enough back. But yes, fathered by the same coalition. Look at them go. They are just having so much fun in this inbuilt, built-in playground that is the dried up Juma Dam. Oh. Just bear with me one second. I need to get onto the game drive comms, but fortunately we have got some amazing sightings to keep us occupied. Roy Roy. Oh, somebody's cross, letting out a little bit of a growl. And Darlene, we haven't even got around to showing you the other part of the sighting and where the cubs have been, or at least one cub was trying to get to. Darlene's watching in New Hampshire. There are the three lionesses plus one sleepy cub, keeping an eye on, sort of, keeping an eye on what's going on. But I'm going to tear you away from those lionesses because look at the cubs in the tree now. Sorry, I'm so distracted. I didn't even show you guys the adult lionesses, but look at this. Look at the tree climbing skills. And not often we get to see lion cubs up a tree bounding to join in the game. It's a rough and tumble world if you're a lion cub. Oops, especially when you step in a hole. Little one. <laughs> Pinned. And every now and again one squeaks when the play gets a little bit too rough. And this is why, and I've spoken about this before, this is why moms hide their cubs for the first six weeks, or one of the reasons why they hide them for the first six weeks of their life before introducing them to the rest of the pride, because the game gets very rough. And for little cubs, they actually aren't always robust enough to handle it. But these guys, they're having a ball. And these playing these games that they're playing right now will be essential for the skills later in life, the skills that we saw in practice just days ago with that buffalo hunt. They're training themselves, oh, and having fun doing it. Intercepted. This is incredible. You can see it in the body language. The more dominant cubs and the... Oh, don't mess with me. I'm a fierce, angry cat. And I'm getting cross. I'm going to come up here and seek refuge on the tree. See how cross that little cub is. Its ears back. It's had enough of the game. Oh, but now it's running away and... Hunting instinct is triggered. Got you by the foot.
Oh, we've seen me and Kahunas do this. Playfully, every now and again, we've been lucky enough to watch sightings like this. And it brings us to Fox Hat's question. Oh, somebody's going to get pounced on. No, no, I'm the king of the castle. <laughs> Fox Hat, I hope you are loving this as much as I am. Fox Hat wants to know what age the cub's teeth will be sharp enough to cut through the skin. They are already. For those of you with puppies or kittens, you know what those needle-like baby teeth are like. Look at them go! Little monsters tearing around the place. <laughs> oh, 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 incoming! Oh, this is just the best game ever. Cornered. <laughs> so, Fox Hat, they are already, but they know to sort of keep it a little bit more relaxed than that so it might they might actually draw blood every now and again but we've seen the Ngormas play with each other we've seen the way that they often batter each other around and they're actually very good at pulling their punches you little one are going to fall out of that tree if you are not careful Sean Sean Roy Roy Sorry everybody I am watching the sighting and I am loving every moment of it I'm just trying to sort something out on the game drive comms as well How did I jump the line up? Copy, thanks. Look at you with your little mangy eye. So the mange that they have... Oops, sorry. I've, been ha I've had my foot on the brake the whole time. I've been so ecstatic with the sighting. The mange that these little cubs have is not life-threatening. It is natural and it came probably from one of their mothers. Uh, we did notice that the Styx females had a little bit of mange. And it will probably come and go throughout their lives as these little ones start to grow older. Oh, you're stuck there. There's claws coming out, getting a bit too much. I don't know where to look, Liam. I don't know how, I don't know where we where we look next. I mean, there's now two cubs on the tree. Sorry, three. Oh no, it's two cubs now. There's two cubs on the on the end of the tree. One of them is going to fall over at some point. I hope you are all loving this. It's incredible. Ooh. Graceful descent, sort of. Not quite the same level of coordination that leopard cubs have. What you doing? And can I join you with your stick? See? See the size difference there? It's very, very clear the Styx cubs. It'll start to disappear as they get older. It'll be harder to tell them apart. Oh! Full of the joys. Scamper. I'm, oh! I'm trying to sneak up on the other... Trying to sneak up on the cub really carefully. But it's very difficult when the mud is all loose. Oh! And there's another game going on there. <laughs> That one with the mangy eye is very easily identifiable. Such characters. Perfect scene of playing cubs. I'm gonna, s I'm gonna stalk the others. I'm gonna try to, but be flummoxed by the other cub. And having walked in these dried up dams before, they're quite um quite risky spots. 
because the, the elephants and the other large animals have walked in the mud and that's dried with these huge pit holes, some of them deep enough to swallow a live cub. They'd be able to get out, but it requires some delicate footwork, the kind of which they haven't quite mastered just yet. <laughs> there you go, look, there's a little bit of blood on that one's belly. That Mm, that might just be from skin problems. But it could also be from the trauma of playing with each other. <laughs> I'm so glad you're all enjoying this with me. Isn't this so special? Oh, got you! Tail! We've arrived at such a perfect time. Here's some. Oh, that's oh, one. <laughs> yeah, good scratching post. Shame. That little one's definitely got the worst of the mange. The one on the left. Hasn't stopped it from being. Terribly playful. Oh. Every now and again you see the slightest expression of panic in the younger one's faces when it gets too but too robust. Oh misstep. And welcome to Cheryl in Illinois. Now Cheryl's been watching since 2014. Oh, there you go, a little bit of affection. Oh, coupled with the odd bite. And Oh, Shem, is your claw stuck? Oh, there we go. We managed to sort it out. Cheryl, no, this isn't the first time we've seen so many cubs playing together. At least, while well, I've perhaps it's, there's been more. There's been other occasions before I started working here, but we did get to see the Styx cubs together like this, although they weren't quite so playful. But we got to see them a week ago, uh, just before Taylor did her interview. We got to see them here on a kudu kill with the three sticks adults and then the little cubs, but they were not nearly nearly as active and as playful as they are right now. This is amazing. This truly is. I think this is, in a way, Cheryl, yes, this is absolutely the most cubs we've seen playing like this, at least. I'm going to stalk, but I'm about to be <laughs> ambush. <laughs> and Cheryl. You're right. Cheryl says she still finds it amazing. I find it amazing. Doesn't matter how long you spend in the bush, how many sights you witness, moments like this never get old. Oh. Especially, and Cheryl will know because she's been watching since 2014, especially with the year that the Inkuhumas and the Sticks had last year. To see this is like we've come full circle. I'm so glad we decided to come to Cheetah Plains. I have to be honest, I wasn't sure if the babies were here, if the cubs were here. I'm thrilled that they are. <laughs> oh, it's tough being a lion cub. Hi, little one. Look at you. With your scabby ears. Shame. Some of them have got really nasty parts to the skin condition. Oh, getting ready to stalk. And the attack is launched. 
the tackle is made. <laughs> Sorry, I was so distracted. Fiona, yes, it is entirely possible for white lions and normal coloured lions to be born to the same litter, especially if you've got two parents that are normal coloured, then but both carry the recessive genes. So most of the cubs will be tawny coloured and maybe one will come out, one or two will come out white. They don't get treated any differently from what we can tell or from what I'm, I've heard about white lion behavior. And I mean, they're not, they're not a special different species, they're just lions. The mothers don't seem to treat them any differently, as far as any research suggests. Oh, that one's still playing king of the castle on his tree. I'm still on my tree. This is my log. I own it. How's this for a scene playing out right in front of us? And thank you to all of those, all of you sending through your screenshots. This is so special. And I, oh, I do have a camera. I'm such an idiot. Brent lent me his camera and I've been sitting here not taking any pictures and now the light's gone. I'm a twit. I got so distracted. But thank you for those of you who take your screenshots because they're memories for us as well as for you for the rest of our lives. We'll always have those screenshots to go back to, which is also truly special. <laughs> See how instinctive some of this stuff is. They haven't learnt this from their parents, or watching their mothers. This is instinct. Just like puppies or kittens. And the perfect chew toy. Andrine, yes, absolutely. These little ones are going to sleep so well tonight. They've tired themselves out, and in fact, one of them has even made its way back to mom, along with the one that was sleeping there, for a bit of cuddle and some gentle affection, rather than the sharp nips and claws of its cousins. Ah, oh, there we go, some gentle grooming. I'm sure it's that one that was trying to get back earlier. That's much nicer. And they will, at some point, curl up in a puddle of cubs and rest. In fact, these two, with their chew toy, or these three, sorry, with their chew toy, the older ones, they, I think they're going to be the ones that sleep best of all. Oh, there goes another little one that's making its way towards Mom, attempting to avoid the attentions of the rest of the lion cubs. Quick, 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 quick. Slowly but surely, one by one, the little ones are getting tired. And it's time to go back to mom. Especially the younger cubs. Here we go. Back to the safety of the adults as it starts to get dark. Like tired children at the end of the day. Let us spend as much time as possible as we can with these little ones because once the sun goes down and it gets too dark for us to watch them we will not be spotlighting them as is to be expected. They're far too young. Oh, look how tentative that is. Mom, are you awake, Mom? Mom? <laughs> I'm not, of course not even sure if that is mom. Might also be aunt. Okay, fine, I'll just hug you regardless. Are you sure you're not awake?
always absentmindedly scratching the poor sticks cubs. And now it's bath time. Bath time for tired little cubs. Getting dark and cold. One more tiny one has to run the gauntlet of the older cubs to get back to the safety of the adult females. Oh, a little bit of affection. The bonds that will last them for the rest of their lives if they're female or male. Half-hearted knock. Everybody's leaving, little one. You're going to get left all alone with your stick. <laughs> and dreams spot on. There's going to be some very tired little cubs at the end of the day. And Gerda seems to be absolutely right. Playtime is over at 5.30 Central African time. Hello. Oh, look at that female. Look at her face. <laughs> Have you ever seen such an unimpressed looking lioness in your entire life? She was fast asleep. Oh, look at the lip twitch. So put upon and long suffering. That is hilarious. All I want to do is sleep, and the kids just won't leave me alone. Her eyes are still closed. It's like if she keeps her eyes closed, she can keep pretending she's asleep and this isn't happening. <laughs> yeah. I'm awake now. I'm going to try to go back to sleep. Oh, little cub doing yoga stretches. And yes, absolutely, Gerda, although, that being said, playtime never quite ends when it's supposed to, does it? There's always those that want to carry on a little bit longer, stretch it for a little bit further. And the biggest member of the group of cubs, which is this little one, to me, it's definitely the largest, and probably a male, but it's hard to tell. I haven't been able to properly confirm. Not quite sure if it's ready to go back to mom yet. And as our cubs start to calm down a little bit as we reach the end of the day, we're right hidden behind a damn wall. Let's go to James, who's got a nice view of the setting sun. It is a nice view, everybody. Unfortunately, it's fading rather more quickly than I thought it was going to. It was really burnished l'orange and red and now it is just sort of very subtle hazy reddy orange yellow over the Drakensberg mountains there the northern fringes thereof we're quite close to Sydney's dam here and we've driven most of the northern Biffles Hook uh, boundary and we found a little couple of impala but that's about all really so we'll go and have a look and see if anything's wanting to have a drink and Wendy has behaved immaculately so far today. She hasn't uh, given us any trouble at all. We're not sure why that should be, because I don't think anybody's done anything to her, but it certainly feels like she's had some work done on her. So, with any luck, when we get to Buffleshook Dam, not Buffleshook Dam, Sydney's Dam, we should still have some signal. No elephants at all, which is just amazing to me. Maybe there'll be one or two having a drink here. Then I suppose it will be time to put on the lights. Amazing, because by this time, of course, 16 days ago when I was on leave, it was dark. We had the lights and the spotlights out already. Not so much now, when I can smell some delightful potato bush smell. Might also be some cooking from a house near the gate. There is... Uh, oh. Oh, well. I mean, there's something at Sydney's Dam there, Jandre. Isn't that impressive? I didn't realise they, they were there. I'm not sure we would have come down here if I'd known that. Anyway. 
that's just digging out the dam in preparation for the deluge that is expected this year. Anyway, as you can see, not much is very thirsty. I think a testament rather to the coof of the day. We've had an unbelievable cat day, of course. Some amazing cats this morning. Both leopard cubs, five, no, three lion cubs, and then a whole eight more now, plus the two leopard cubs. So really rather a cub spectacular day. Right, now before it gets too dark, let's go back to Jamie and those cubs for the last little embers of the day. We'll head south and see if we can find something else. And it is indeed starting to get a little bit dark. The youngsters that have been sort of left behind from the game are now calling across to the adults with the little ow, ow cub sounds and even the lionesses seem to think that perhaps it's time that they were on their way oh or not nice that regardless of the bonds that they have with their cubs their bond with each other is still equally strong Nothing like the sound effects from Ryan Cubs. Oh. Yes, such a big scary noise. One day, little one, your noise will strike fear across the African plains, but not just yet. Picture of contentment. Casting an eye across to the rest of the little cubs that are starting to Think about, believe it or not, playing again. The fear of missing out is fierce with little live cubs. And they are keen to start the game up again. Trotting over to investigate. What are you doing? <laughs> Can I join you? That was my stick originally. Except for this little guy's found the comfiest spot in the mud. <laughs> Is that really cozy, little one? Nestled in the mud, in the dried mud of Juma Dam. Still too much going on. I still don't know where to look. It is clearly getting a bit too dark, but we're going to stretch this for as long as we possibly can before we have to go making little begging sounds and the cubs look in places quite distressing with their mange Penny Pine wanted to know whether or not perhaps the mother's saliva would help to rid or to help reduce the mange that they have around on their skin. Penny Pine, I don't think so. In a way, I think it might actually serve to worsen it, um, just from that constant irritation. I know that saliva does have certain antibiotic properties in certain situations. Lion saliva... It's not the, uh, the lion mouth is not the cleanest place in the world, so especially when there's open skin, she might even increase the chance of infection. But she's keeping it clean, and the rasping probably really helps with the itchiness, because of course lions have that incredible, um, those incredible spurs on their tongue that 
they use to, that can actually strip meat from bone, although they utilize it a bit more gently on their own skin, and for good reason, and on their cubs. We're so, so incredibly lucky that these animals feel so comfortable around us that we can sit and watch them going about their daily lives, learning to be great and fierce hunters. Sort of. Oh, bless you. Penny Pine, I might do some more research into mange and see whether there's any chance that the female saliva will help. I don't think so. But I could, I could stand corrected on that, and I'm happy to be corrected. If any of you know anything more about saliva and mange, I don't. And I, in my own mind, I doubt whether it would help at all. But perhaps there is a reason why it might, and I'd be happy to hear from all of you if you've got more information about that. You're welcome to send that, along with any questions you have through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through on questions at wildearth.tv bath time. After play time comes bath time. And we've had several little cubs get so close to us now. Look at this. I mean they're right next to us. They haven't given us a second look. Playing next to the car. Clonk. You are a very brave, little one. Are you a fierce and scary hunter? This log just proved to be too much of an attraction for you. It's definitely the biggest one of the group. Hello, you. So distracted. Roger says that he wonders where the moms are going to stash them before they go out hunting. And it's a good question, Roger, because some of the little ones are just too small to accompany the adults on their hunts, but very soon they will be going with. And then whenever the females come across something they want to hunt, they just give the signal to the cubs to sit down and stay still. Although once they start to get a little bit older, I've seen cubs of around six months old repeatedly mess up a hunt, much to the chagrin of their poor mothers. Is that log very tasty? Mm -hmm. You're getting very brave, and whilst you are not very scary, your mum is. And I'm not going to mess with your mother, so please don't decide to come any closer. I do feel as though mum is really keeping a close eye on us, or she was. Just making sure that we're up to no good. Oh, that we are not up to no good. It's all right, girl. I promise you, I don't mean any harm to your little ones. <laughs> you little attention seeker, you. Oh. Oh, I was about to say time to get up. Clearly not. Perhaps time to suckle in. When last time I saw these six cubs, only one of the females seemed to be lactating, and as a result, she found herself with a bundle of cubs attached to her belly, which she didn't seem terribly worried about, but I couldn't help feeling sorry for her. Though it'll probably be the mother of the youngest cubs that's still lactating, but with all lions, they will aloe suckle. I think it's getting a little bit dark now. Might be time for us to say goodbye. I do wish, though, that we didn't have to. I also sort of wish we didn't have cubs right next to us now, because I'm not entirely sure how one goes about starting the vehicle without startling them, although they seem very, very relaxed. Hey, little ones. Did you have to come here now? Hmm? Are you adventuring? You're adventuring very far from Mom. Well, the Styx's pride has gone from strength to strength since that disastrous day. Just around this time last year, 
or maybe just a little bit more than a year ago, that the Birmingham boys killed all three of the new Styx cubs that we'd been watching. It was a very, very sad day for all of us here at Wild Earth and Safari Live and all of our viewers. But the Styx Pride has come to their moment of triumph once again, just like the Inkahumas, with a bundle of eight new healthy little baby lions. And it's time for us to say goodbye to them. I think it is really too dark. I'm going to have to try and start up a vehicle without scaring anybody. Oh, breakfast. Oh, dinner time now. Dinner time for tired cubs. And very soon bedtime. Or, maybe not bedtime, maybe up and about and going for a walk with mom. Time for us to go, sadly, I wish, it, I wish it were not so. But we're going to leave them, and while we extricate ourselves from Juma Dam, we're going to send you back over to Brent for an... Ah, uh, Brent. James, sorry, I've been looking to Brent for the last two weeks. James, James, James is back from leave. We're going to send you over to James and find out what his afternoon, or how his afternoon is treating him. I wonder how Brent Leo Smith would feel about his um, nearest and dearest confusing me for him. I shall have to ask him when I get home. Anyway, everybody, we have found absolutely nothing except now a fairly stiff breeze blowing out of the southeast. And that's just because the sun's gone down and so the catabatic flow of air coming out of the drainage systems, out of the slopes up onto the top, is starting to blow, I think. It's definitely the temperature change that's done it. But the clouds that were threatening to rain on us have disappeared somewhere probably over the Mozambican Channel by now. And so there will be no further rain, I don't think, today. So watch your heads here, everybody. Duck down. I was rather hoping to find some kind of a cat around here. Uh, mostly I was hoping to find Shadow. Because uh, she has been very unkind to me, you know. She has not introduced me to her no new daughter. And I really want to see her new daughter. And <laughs> no one's given her a name yet, so she maintains the, the name I gave her. And that is uh, Zara, of course. <laughs> Much to the disgust of Brent Leo Smith. <laughs> so that's what is going to remain until uh, the Rangers name her something else. Hello, Russell, a.k.a. Mafuta. Um, I'm not sure why you've given yourself that name. Are you um, a bit of a pie-eater, Russell? Mafuta, everybody, is uh, the Zulu word for fat, so I, I, I'm, I, I, hopefully you're not being insulting to yourself there, Russell. Russell, um, you're coming in September, you say, and you say, what will the game viewing be like? Russell, uh, I think you're a South African from what it sounds like, you're in Je Johannesburg, so you'll be used to our kind of winter vegetation, the colours you get of winter. September is harsh um, until you're used to it, but you will be used to it, and so I think you're going to find that the game viewing in this area is exceptional um, in September. It will be dry, there will be no leaves on the trees, there will be the odd knob thorn with its flowers which will smell delicious, Everything will be concentrated around the little bit of water that there is, so I think you're going to have a really good time here in September. By here, do you actually mean Juma or do you mean the Kruger Park in general? I mean, either way, I think you're going to have some pretty good sightings. Ah, and you're coming to Juma. Oh, you have been here before. Uh, I think you're going to have a great time here. I think the, especially, I'm going to guess that around September time, uh, driving out of the Juma camps, where Taylor or Gallagher, you go and sit at one of those water holes and don't move from there, I think you're going to see action. I think it's going to be really good. And just remember, everybody, as we go towards September, um, August is when our first few migrants will come back. Uh, not, I know that you were discussing the woodland kingfisher earlier with Jamie. They won't come back yet. But certainly the Wahlberg's eagle, and the yellow-billed kite are the two first ones we must watch out for. And 
especially our little couples of Wahlbergs that arrive and they come back to their same nests. I especially love our pair of pale forms. I think I've got all the lights on that I can, Jandri. Oh, no, I don't. Hang on, there we go. Jandri was just signaling me subtly like this. Basically, he meant to say, turn the light on, you idiot. It's dark now. Fair enough. Of course you would. Um, there's an impala down there, which we're not going to look at, because we don't shine on them. <laughs> right, uh, yet again I'm flummoxed by the astounding uh, ingenuity of people who name themselves on the Twitterverse. Uh, Dispatch Griffin. Uh, from the United States, I think that was. Uh, you say, you've noticed that Impala and Nyala are uh, very common out here, and are they a pest in gardens and farmlands like white-tailed deer are? Uh, no, they're not uh, really. They normally only occur in these sort of uh, private reserve or in protected areas. They do occur outside of some protected areas, but they tend to stay away from any kind of human activity. Um, you will find the odd situation where a nyala or a bushbuck might get into a vegetable patch and do a bit of damage. But, uh, well, in fact, in fact and um, I, I don't know if he's watching, but Brian Joubert planted a magnificent garden of sunflowers. And one morning, uh, while we were on leave, a bushbuck came and ate them all. So he's going to be very upset by that. So the bushbuck was slightly, I suppose, a pest there. But no, they're certainly not um, a pest that anyone really worries about. Thank you, Dispatch Griffin. I'm not looking forward to when Brian sees his beautiful sunflowers. The stalks are still there, so maybe they'll grow. He's going to be so cross. Uh, well, poor old Brian. Brian is back tomorrow, everybody. And uh, the quietness of the night continues. No shadow, no Zara, no Sundile. Now, word on the street has it that shadow is being pushed um, sort of squished in her territory by Karula sort of to the north and to the east and by Salayeshe, interestingly, who's come across from Elephant Plains and Simbambili to the north and west. And I just said to Brent, I wondered if that wasn't because she, Shadow, hadn't moved a little bit further south into Kwatile's territory. Kwatile, a recently deceased leopard, we think, um, fell prey, not prey so much as a victim, to a snake bite. And I wonder if that isn't what's happened. But Brent reckons that she's also being pushed from the south by another leopard. So, quite interesting that. And that's also being pushed from the south by another leopard. So, quite interesting that. And that's why I came down here. I thought if she is being squished, then the chances of us seeing her are that much higher. There are some zebra. The genre, that's exactly how we finished drive yesterday some zebra that were invisible to everybody except me. And we can't see those, can we, Jean-André? Can we try? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. There we go. <laughs> and Brian Joubert is watching and unfortunately he's found out about his um, his sunflowers as a result of uh, me. Sorry about that, Brian. I wasn't here. I was on leave. Um, so I do hope that they come back. I can tell you that the stalks are still there. They're still green. I think they'll grow back again. On we go. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Hang on, we might get a nice picture here. We won't, will we, Andre? Okay, never mind. Not enough light. It was, a, it was a zebra looking out west over the incredible sunset. That's quite sweet to see, but it would have been invisible to you, I'm afraid. Let's 
carry on this way. Brian, I have some more. I have some more sunflower seeds. If you want to plant further, you can have them. <laughs> I think that's magnificent. That Brian is watching on his leave. That's that's fantastic. Just going to turn the lights off here because there's some impala. Now, we had a question about whether white-tailed deer are in any way similar, I suppose, to Impala and Yala. Well, they are, in that I know that they get stunned by lights. Impala get completely stunned by lights, so we're just going to turn them off as we go past. And there we are, we'll turn them back on again. Right, let's try and find something nocturnal, shall we, Jandre? Something that we can put a light on so you don't complain to me that I'm telling you to film impossible things. What a chilly wind. And we don't have too much time left. So I'm going to drive just slightly quicker to see if we don't spot something in the few remaining minutes. I haven't driven down here since I came back from leave. Not one elephant seen, oh no, there were, there were two elephants seen on Juma today. They went north into Buffalo's Hook, but that's it. There are no tracks of elephants, they are simply not around. And I'd love to know if anybody had any theories about why that is, that are perhaps better than the theory I gave you. This morning. All right, that's going to be it from us, everyone. Uh, Jean-Dre and I are now going to have our supper, aren't we, Jean-Dre? Yes. Yeah, jean is looking very hungry at the moment. We'll hand you back across to, to Jamie for the last few minutes. Thank you very much for joining us on what has been an amazing afternoon, and we'll see you tomorrow as the dawn breaks at 06.30. Bye-bye. And we are also heading back for supper. I think that both Liam and myself have definitely worked up an appetite. Or at least we worked up an appetite watching the cubs work up an appetite. The reason I've got all my lights off is we've got another vehicle coming past us. Let's just navigate around. I don't know who we've got here. How's it? Hello, Jenny. How are you? Very good. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. Hello, everybody. Did you leave that in Gala Samuel Lock? Yeah, I left in Gala Samuel Lock. It's too dark. Down, not moving at all. Uh, well, females were getting up and yawning. But um, but not. It looked like maybe they were looking south. Yeah. But they were just too dark for us with all the milking buns. Okay. Okay. All right. Ciao. Cheers, guys. Ciao. Enjoy. Thank you. Bye. Sorry, everybody. Just giving Andres an update about how much longer they or the, where the lines were going after we left them. Yes, looking absolutely thrilled, like they've had an amazing afternoon. So hopefully they've got a good one to look forward to tomorrow, as do we. Perhaps the sticks will still be around, perhaps the Inkahumas will pop their noses back out of that drainage line system, and hopefully Karula, Cubs, maybe even Tingana will still be in the same spot. We'll have to wait for tomorrow morning to find out, but the prospects are good and the place seems to be exploding with tiny baby cats absolutely everywhere. Aren't we spoiled? We've come to the end of our sunset safari and it's time to do our thank yous and farewells. Uh, thank you to Liam for his fantastic camera work. It's lovely to have you back, Liam. As well as to Kirsty, as it's also lovely to have Kirsty back and all of the lovely ladies in final control. Most importantly, a huge big thank you to all of you. I'm looking forward to seeing your screenshots when I get home tonight. In the meantime, we will catch you in a few hours for the Bye everybody and enjoy your day.